Tony, um, I have the pleasure to invite um, Professor Luis Davidovich, President of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Professor Alfredo Tomas King from the Museum of Tomorrow. Professor Manuel Limonta, Director from the EXO Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. And Professor Ingrid Dillo, Vice Chair of EXO WDS and Data Achieving and Network Services. Professor Davidovich, you have the floor. Yeah. So welcome you all. It's a big pleasure to uh, host you here in this uh, in the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Uh, you know, we consider the Brazilian Academy of Sciences as, as a center of thinking about the country, about Brazil. And in fact, we have uh, done uh, lots of work on that with proposals for public policy, uh, which uh, we would... Uh, really love to have them uh, uh, considered by the government. Of course, that's uh, not always the case, to say the least. But anyway, we have done uh, uh, lots of work on several levels of education, on the Amazon region, on several problems related to health, uh, a broad range of subjects, and am today very happy to host in the Brazilian Academy such an important theme as the World Data System. And, uh, and I want to thank, in particular, Alfredo Tomas King, who, who actually had the initiative of proposing this symposium. He approached us at the Brazilian Academy of Science. And I should say that there is a, a very uh, close relationship. Uh, it's a thematic relationship between the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and the Museum of Tomorrow, for the very simple reason that both the Brazilian Academy and the museum, as the name of the museum suggests, have a vision of the future. And they look at, at the future and have proposals for the future. So I'm very happy to host you here. Uh, I hope you have a very productive uh, conference. I want to thank everybody who participated in the organization of this event. I want to thank Marcos Cortezão, who actually coordinated from the side of the Brazilian Academy this, this event and all the members of the Academy who participated too. So, have a, an excellent uh, two-day uh, symposium, uh, and thank you very much for coming here and participating in this symposium. Good morning. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome all participants to this workshop. We are very glad to have this room so crowded. We, in the very beginning, we are we are thinking this would be a very little uh, meeting, uh, and we are very glad to see how many uh, people interested, engaged in the this the subject of the scientific data management. Um, I am here on behalf of the general director of the Museum of Tomorrow, Ricard Piquet, that he's uh, traveling abroad, could not attend, but said, as uh, Luis Davidovich said, we are taking a very close uh, a partnership between the Academy and the, and the Museum of Tomorrow. In general, all the, uh, the meetings are at the museum, and that's the first time we have the meeting here at the Academy. And so uh, the museum uh, try to engage people, visitors, to think about our tomorrow. And that data system is also very close to our tomorrow, or I would say the tomorrow of the science, and the kind of science with open data, 
with open information that people that scientists can share more deeply the information and so uh, i think also the team is very close to the museum of tomorrow proposal so uh, there are many uh, very important uh, many partners here but i would like to 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 quote especially uh, Professor Gadelia, director of the National Laboratory of Scientific Computation, that also uh, helped us in the organizing of this uh, this meeting. So uh, thank you very much for everybody here, and I hope we have a very nice and possible meeting. Thank you. Professor Manuel Milanta. Uh, bon uh, bon dia. Uh, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, I like to thank this possibility, like to thank the Professor Luis Davidovic, the president of this prestigious Academy of Science for the opportunity of this uh, important meeting. I'd like to thank uh, Alfredo uh, with his active participation in uh, organizing this activity as well and in that the beautiful museum that probably most of you have known. Those who have, haven't been there, I invite him, I invite you in his behalf to visit that beautiful place. I'd like to thank Mutafam Ukraine for the, for his active participation in this meeting. Also, I'd like to thank the two Marcos here, one from Inter-American Institute and the other one, Marcos from, from the Academy of Science uh, of, Bra of Brazil. My organization, the International Council for Science, is very interested in the evolution and uh, the work on the data in general. So the use of uh, data and the speed of the data transmission is uh, something that we are, are working uh, very hard to, to push this in all the region. Therefore, this type of meeting is helping us very much. So, uh, I like to to thank as well all the participants, and I hope this will be a very interesting meeting, not only to to start in doing new things, but also to uh, enlarge the the family of people working in in data and. Uh, and all the this related activities. So thank you very much. I wish you a successful meeting. Thank you. Professor Ingrid Demo. Thank you very much. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. As the last speaker in this row, um, I do not want to take up too much of our precious time before we really dive into the content of this workshop. Um, but a few words from my side as well. Unfortunately, the chair of the scientific committee of WDS could not make it today, um, Sandy Harrison, um, but she will join us tomorrow, so you will hear her and see her tomorrow. Um, but therefore, as one of the co-chairs of WDS, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you here present today on behalf of the whole scientific committee of WDS. And we are all very excited to be uh, here in Rio. This Latin American and Caribbean workshop um, on scientific data management is part of a series of regional workshops that the WDS is organizing. And we already had similar and very successful um, events for the African region and also for the Asian Pacific region. 
and now we're in Brazil. In today's world, we are, of course, facing many, many grand challenges um, concerning our environment, concerning our society. And these are very big challenges that require collaborative research on a truly global scale if we want to solve these issues. <laughs> now, to enable this research, we need high quality and effective research data management that makes research reproducible and that makes data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and most of all, reusable. And WDS aims to contribute to these goals by building worldwide communities of excellence for scientific data services. And we've been trying to reach out to the data management community on a global scale. And of course, in order to be a truly global organization, we need to strengthen our activities both in Africa as well as in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Now, you will, of course, hear a lot more about the WDS organization and its goals and its activities in the course of this workshop. And we, as WDS, very much see this workshop as the starting point for a dialogue, for us to learn about the data management activities in your region and to raise awareness about the important issues that are mentioned and to encourage involvement of the region um, in the international initiatives like the World Data System, but also other initiatives like um, the Research Data Alliance and CoData. There are many organizations um, working in the field of research and data, and we as WDS are also working very closely with these organizations. So we hope that this workshop um, will also play a role in bringing closer the many initiatives in the area of research data management that are going, in, going on within this region itself. Because um, the Latin American and Caribbean region is vast and very diverse, and I can very, very well imagine that also for you it is very difficult to get an overview of the things that are going on here. Um, so we hope that this workshop contributes to that as well. And we are, of course, very grateful that so many of you showed an interest in this workshop and you have been willing to travel here and devote time to this initiative. And we are very fortunate um, to have a long list of speakers and presenters for the coming two days. And I'm pretty sure that we will all have a much better overview of what is happening in this region by the end of tomorrow. And hopefully we will also be able to give you a good insight into the work of WDS. Now, before we start, I, I would really like to express a special thanks, because a lot of organizations have been involved in the preparation of all of this, but a special thanks should go to the Brazilian Academy of Science, the regional office of ICSU in um, Latin America and the Caribbean, and the Inter-American Network of Academies of Sciences for their support to the workshop. So thank you all very much, and I wish you and myself a very fruitful and exciting two days at this workshop. Thank you. So let, let us move on for to the first session. Alfredo will continue there. I, I will take over as the moderator of the session. Thank you, James. Testing. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So uh, let's start our first panel, State of Art and Future Perspectives for Scientific uh, Data Management. We have, a, it's a work of a, a presentation of Alex de Cherbin of University of Columbia and Vin Ugo of uh, South Africa. Uh, uh, both of, the, of them are members of the scientific committee 
of WDS, and uh, I am aware that I asked them a very difficult task. To I asked to to think what the challenges, the perspectives, the new paths for a for the future of scientific data data management, and I, I would like to thank especially Alex and Vin that I, I know that they worked a lot in this uh, in this presentation. So thanks. Well, thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so without further ado, I think we'll just get started. Um, and in case you're prone to dozing off. Uh, okay. Uh, my key points and our key points are uh, that open data drives open science. Big data dis drives discovery. Hopefully you will see and you, you probably already know. Some of these things you already know, so that's good. Data repositories go beyond preserving bits and bytes. Data search leads to data discovery. The cloud represents an important development for storage and services, but is not a sea change meaning it's not revolutionary, perhaps it's more evolutionary. Data need to be well documented in order to be well used. And linked open data paved the way for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I particularly tapped Vim uh, Hugo to address that last point. So what are open data? Open data are data that are accessible for free or at least at negligible cost. That means at low cost. Um, perhaps only at the cost of recovery, uh, cost recovery of the organization responsible for them, and with minimal limitations on their use, transformation, and distribution. Open data may be re machine readable and an input for machine learning. So there are computer algorithms that have the ability to learn and to make better predictions based on what was experienced in the past, such as, for instance, spam filtering. That's a, an, uh, a use of machine learning that we're all familiar with. So I like this quote, big data and open data movements will be the two main pillars of the larger data revolution. I'll be talking a bit more about that data revolution in a few minutes. Both rise against a background of increased public demand for openness, agility, transparency, and accountability for public data and actions. So the political overtones are, are clear. So I, I think one thing that's important to realize is there are Important implications of open data, not only for science, but for society at large. And I, that, that's some of what we'll be touching upon today. So there are kind of two models of data policy, and I'm going to paint them in kind of black and white terms, uh, caricatures, if you will, uh, so that it's made somewhat clear and apparent what I'm getting at, realizing that often these caricatures are inadequate. The old school approach is that information is power. Information has a price. Data producers must recover the costs of data production from their users. Users are unable to redistribute value-added products owing to restrictive licenses. So think about line ministries or agencies of many governments that collect data. They produce, say, pretty maps or weather reports or things like that. But the data are entirely proprietary and require that the users pay for those data. In contrast, the new world of open data is one where information is provided free of charge and without, and without restriction unless those restrictions are required for reasons of confidentiality or others, which I'll go into a little bit more in, in, later in the presentation. Society as a result is better informed. Public policy is informed by data and scientific information. Scientific innovation accelerates because the data are no longer a barrier to entry for the scientists. Lower cost to industry, so industry actually develops uh, sub-industries, small enterprises that make use of data. Information sector is spawned and grows. Ultimately, taxes on this sector fund data development. And the emphasis is no longer on the data themselves, but rather the services that are built on those data. So it's kind of a new model, if you will, of both scientific enterprise and public policy and democratization of data. This is a study that's somewhat old. It's now uh, 2011, well, seven years old. It's not that old, 
But basically, uh, this uh, study looked at the benefits to society uh, from the public sector information that was made available free of charge in the European uh, EU 27, the 27 European Union members. Basically, the bottom line is on the right-hand side, they estimate the direct and indirect economic impacts of public sector information applications in the neighborhood of 140 billion euros. That's, in other words, revenues that were generated from data that were made available free of charge. I'm a member of the advisory committee for this consortium, which is called the Consortium for the Valuation of Applications Benefits Linked with Earth Science. Sorry, it's a very bad name, but the, but the acronym is great, Valuables. So it's really about the value of information, the value of particularly earth science and remotely sensed data. And one of the things that the Valuables Consortium is doing is conducting impact assessments that looked at, look at and quantify the economic value of satellite applications in areas such as air quality, monitoring, climate observation, water resources man management. And they're also building the capacity of earth scientists to conduct these kinds of uh, studies. So they're actually helping earth scientists to become better economists for, for better or worse. Um, but the idea is that they need uh, actually, you know, in America right now, some of you may be aware, there's a bit of a war on science. And there's a sense that science is under a bit of a, a threat. And if earth scientists themselves actually need to be in a better position to actually defend the data and the systems that collect those data in terms of economic value to society. So one of the things that they are doing is quantifying the socioeconomic benefits of open data and that this requires us to not only look at, uh, we, we have to basically do a comparison. We need to look at the outcomes of decisions made when data are open to the outcomes of those decisions when the data are not open or not available. In essence, you need to do a counterfactual. What would have happened if the data were not available? How would have decisions, uh, would decisions have been made in the absence of open data? So this is a classic graph showing uh, the, the date 2008 when Landsat data were made free and open by the USGS. This is Barb Ryan, really was responsible for this. She's the head of GEO. And with that policy, basically, the number of scenes downloaded increased exponentially. This is Landsat, the workhorse for a lot of earth science research. But also, as we'll see, some kind of economic benefits accrue not outside the scientific realm. So until 2008, USGS received $4.5 million a year for Landsat data. Most of that money actually came from other government agencies paying USGS, the US Geological Survey, to provide the Landsat data. Each scene costs about $600. If you go back earlier when Landsat was privatized to the 1990s in the Reagan era uh, legacy period, basically Landsat scenes were sold for around $2,000 each. And then there was a market for their reuse. And so there became websites that would repost Landsat data that were already acquired. And other scientists would download them and use them for their research. After the data were distributed free and open, it generated $1.5 billion, billion dollars worth of benefits to society and to the US economy. But actually, this could be an underestimate. The Valuables Consortium uh, actually commissioned some research and this fellow, uh, Dr. Nagaraj from UC Berkeley, did a study that looked at uh, Landsat data availability in relation to gold mine, uh, gold uh, discoveries, deposits of gold. Apparently, Landsat information is very useful to researchers looking for gold deposits. And they had a natural experiment. Some parts of the world have cloud cover or they have uh, problems with data acquisition that have resulted in far fewer scenes being acquired in those regions. It became a natural experiment. They could then test the hypothesis that data uh, gold discoveries were much more frequent in those areas that were more frequently mapped by Landsat. And what they found was that based on their estimates for a country the size of the US, gold reserves worth an additional 6.4 billion US dollars were could be attributed to the information from the Landsat program. So there was a case and a, a, a useful example of what decisions can be made in the absence of information and data and what decisions can be made in the presence. 
One thing I want to emphasize is that many of you represent data repositories or data producing organizations. If you are such an organization, you should have a data policy, period. You should have some kind of data policy that says whether the data are free or open, and hopefully they will be, and under what circumstances and in what ways. So we have our own data policy, which I put up here on the screen. I'm sorry you can't read it, but it's very, very detailed, and it goes into the precedents and the kind of uh, global and international consensus that's being built up around open and free data. The world data system itself has its own open data principles, and I'm not going to read through them entirely, but one of the things you'll see here is that public data should be made available with minimum time delay and free of charge and for no more than the cost of dissemination. In other words, it shouldn't cost you more to obtain the data than it costs them to burn the data to a DVD and send it to you. Hopefully also maybe then the cost it, it co uh, the cost it may it, they may incur in distributing the data online. So it should not cost more than that and it should be waived for low income countries. Uh, only in cases where data are sensitive or restricted should there be some restrictions on those data, but that should be with appropriate justification and following clearly defined protocols. So these are kind of limiting the scope and the range of, uh, uh, of maneuver for, for charging for data. You may want to choose licenses for your data. There are very common uh, and widely used licenses. Some of them are from the kind of creative commons and artistic world, and some of them are from more of the scientific domain. Uh, Either one can be used, and basically the one that we choose for most of our data is what's called CC BY, which uh, CC zero, which is a Creative Commons zero open license with BY, which means BY means attribution only. <coughs> Essentially, we're asking people that the, they cite our data and they cite us, and we provide a citation for each of the data sets we distribute through our NASA data center called the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. So there's two diagrams I he have here about big data. One of them I just thought does a nice job of sort of describing the three V's of data, uh, big data, which are velocity, the speed at which data are generated from kind of the old school of you got it once every month or maybe once a year up to real-time data, data volumes from kilobytes up to petabytes, and then the variety of different types of data, which are... Uh, the old school, you know, in common tabular formats and reports and databases, all the way up to mo mobile data, social data, uh, um, you know, Twitter feeds and things like that, and a lot of data that are generated by our cell phones constantly whenever time we use our smartphone for an application. I like this diagram as well because it kind of says if you go above certain levels of volumes, variety, and velocity, Basically, you're getting into the big data realm. Uh, you're leaving the, the comfort zone of small data. I, I think there's a lot of hype about big data, but we can just think of it as essentially lots of data and lots of different types of data. And it does pose certain challenges insofar as those data have many different formats and different uh, requirements in terms of their processing. And we can also get into very difficult ethical issues of uh, confidentiality, as we saw recently with the big data that were downloaded by uh, Cambridge Analytica and in, in used for political pollstering and things like that and, and targeting of advertisements in the U.S. It's also important to add a, a fourth V for veracity. This is where the trustworthiness of data and the trustworthiness of digital repositories comes in. We need to be sure that the data we're using are actually precise and accurate and they reflect the reality in the real world. Um, we can come back to that. I'm sure it will be a common theme in our discussions. So big data is also linked to the data revolution, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there was this report. Uh, actually, our director at Season was one of the members of this independent expert advisory group. His name is Bob Chen. And uh, basically what we are finding is that the data revolution represents a combination of big data, open data, and data analytics, such as machine learning and AI which has greatly accelerated scientific discovery and innovation across multiple scientific fields, as well as economic sectors. Uh, it's more diverse, integrated, and timely trustworthy information that can lead to better decision-making and real-time citizen feedback. This helps societies and private institutions and individuals make choices that are good for them in the world they live in. 
One of the things that this report mentioned, though, is that too often existing data remain unused because they are released too late or not at all. They're not well documented or harmonized or not available at the level of detail needed for decision making. So it's something that we need to be aware of is that a lot of data essentially die or uh, get buried or are lost on tapes or lost on individual researchers' hard drives, and they never see the light of day. That's changing, but it's something that I think needs to be accelerated. We need to rescue more of those data. And then trustworthy digital repositories are an important part of the data ecosystem in a big data world. So I'm going to be talking a bit more about these data repositories. This is an example of our data repository, which is called the CDAC. It's a NASA data center, part of the NASA DAC system under ESDIS. Uh, this is an example of an open data repository called Dryad. And this is VIM's data repository called Scion, and he can speak more about that later on ecological observ observations in Southern Africa. There's some pros and cons to both types of models. There's the domain-specific repositories and there's the open repositories. The domain-specific repositories um, generally uh, are characterized by expertise for curation and management, commitment to long-term preservation of those data, expert guidance from advisory groups. So most of our data centers have some kind of advisory committee that advises them on what data to curate, what data to, to archive or put in long-term archive um, or to deprecate. Links to larger networks. So they're often part of a long, uh, large scientific networks of say volcanologists or astronomers or medical scientists working in certain domain areas and they have those links and they know the, know the data very well. There's a higher likelihood that data in these repositories are going to be discovered for reasons I'll describe in a minute. So examples of domain-specific repositories include most of the WDS members, but there's also many others that are not WDS members. We encourage some of you as Latin American data repositories to become WDS members. Open repositories, on the other hand, provide lower costs of operation in some cases. There are lower levels of effort or barriers to entry on the part of researchers. So if you just want to stick your data somewhere, it's a quick way to do it. Uh, there may even be a misperception on the part of some researchers that they would have to pay or do other things to get their data into a domain-specific repository. Also, there's a need on the part of uh, the research community to put their data somewhere because publishers, journal article, journals, and funders often require those data be put somewhere. So that is a reason, one reason why uh, Zenodo, Mendeley, Dryad, and other uh, open repositories exist. But one of the things I want to make a point of is that an archive is more than just bits and bytes of data. It needs to enable people to use the data set in the future, and it needs to preserve those bits and bytes over the long haul. So that's one reason and one argument for using domain-specific repositories. Um, so Google is one of the ways that many people find data today, and uh, it's not a bad way of finding data, but it's not the only way. Um, many of the domain-specific repositories feed into these larger uh, catalogs. Uh, so we put metadata in our NASA data center that go into Earth data, which becomes then a kind of master catalog of all the data that NASA disseminates, Earth science data, that is, not astro astronomic data. Uh, there's GEO's portal for spatial data through GEO, and then GIBIF is an example of a large catalog uh, that basically aggregates or allows people to search across multiple catalogs of biodiversity information. Just hit the wrong button. Um, so one thing that's important to realize is that Google is moving into this space, uh, and uh, one of the things that is, is happening is they're working on systems that will allow structured queries of metadata that will allow such now currently many of you may search for airline prices or appliances or other things on Google using structured queries so Google will be moving into this domain increasingly uh, so it's something just to be aware of um, one of the things that catalogs require is metadata, and so some people are mystified about this term metadata. I remember when I first entered the data realm, I was wondering, what is metadata? Data about data? Well, yes, and maybe more than that. They're actually kind of the basic reporting blocks, uh, building blocks of what uh, to describe the data, 
the who created the data, the what is the content, when were the data created, where in the world were the data collected, how are the data developed, and why are the data developed. All of that should be answered in metadata. And so you can think of a standard product in America. We drink a lot of V8, which is uh, supposed to be good for you. And um, you have a title, supplemental information, an abstract. 100% uh, vegetable juice, I think, is the abstract. Time period, author, sources, and then you can go even more in depth and look at the entity and the attributes of that <coughs> bottle of V8 juice and understand what's in that bottle. And so that's kind of what metadata represent to data. Um, what we believe at, at CDAC, our, our, our data center, is that often users want more than just plain metadata. They actually want essentially a small data publication that describes why the data were developed, what were the methods and the input data sources for that data set or service. Um, and uh, so we have developed much um, sometimes five to ten page documentation that accompanies our data sets that includes many of these elements that I described earlier, including limitations of the data, any disclaimers, any use constraints. Often commercial firms want to know if there's anything that would restrict their use of those data or get them into legal trouble. And then we also provide even data revision histories and contributing authors, etc. So one question that Alfredo mentioned was, what about the cloud? How does the cloud change? Is it a game changer? I would say it is in some ways. It may reduce costs significantly for some repositories. Um, and so there are repositories that are moving their holdings to the cloud. Cloud services can save money, especially for storage, backup, and security. It can guarantee up-to-date infrastructure and scalability, so you can scale up much more easily with a cloud infrastructure, uh, cloud-based uh, data and computing. Um, so instead of spending money on fixed infrastructure, costs become monthly. Costs are partly based on storage and partly on egress. In other words, you pay money when someone tries to get your data out. This is becoming a little bit of a conundrum for us in the NASA data world because they want to move all our services onto the cloud. But actually, our biggest data users are China and a few other countries, U.S., but China is right after that. And I think Congress may have a problem if it turns out that most of our costs are actually going to supplying data to a country that right now we're in competition with. So it's something that you need to consider in terms of the, the politics and the optics behind that. However, cloud services do not eliminate the need for domain expertise. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Vim, who's going to wrap this up. And sorry, I went over a little bit, but hopefully it's useful. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so I want to maybe focus then just on a few uh, aspects of what we think the future directions of data management might be. Um, Alex has made mention of the fact that Google, for instance, is now looking at making their searches a lot more structured by including all kinds of micro metadata into documents and publications and data sets and the like. Now, the reason this is being done is because the semantic web, which essentially links everything in the web to everything else in one way or another, is not really useful for science. So this is research that was done with a few use cases maybe uh, eight or nine years ago now. And the finding is that while Google will really get you to discover almost anything, um, well, the other way of looking at it is who of you have ever gone to the second page of a Google search result? Hands up. A few times. And to the third page or the fifth page. So Google will find almost anything, but the usefulness of the search is particularly limited when it comes to precise applications such as we have in science. So there has to be some kind of intervention in the building of the semantic web if we want to make it more useful for science. And that intervention is, amongst other things, served by an, by an idea called linked open data. And what linked open data does is to provide a long, a long running persistent identifier to anything that we wish to reference, whether it's a data set, a researcher, a concept, an institution, 
basically anything can have a persistent identifier in the web. For those of you old enough to have worked in the days of relational databases many years ago, this is the same idea as having a, a unique identifier or a key for every table in a relational database. And what is essentially happening is that we are rebuilding relational databases retroactively in the web by implementing linked open data. But in practice, what this means is that we are building registries of links between things in the web, as I said, things like data objects or scholarly publications or the researchers, the authors that produce those outputs, the institutions that they work for, the kind of topics that they're interested in, and so on. And this is essentially establishing a secondary fabric that is much more precise than the semantic web in the background that is more useful for science. And in the WDS, we've started referring to this as something that we call a knowledge network. And this is quite a complicated slide, but I'm just going to highlight a few aspects of it. So what we're saying is that there is emerging services in the web that has persistent identifiers for everything that we work with. People generally now have an orchid. Most researchers might have one. Um, most of our data objects have a persistent identifier that's issued by institutions such as DataCite, maybe others, the handle system being another one that's in common use. And most scholarly publications now have a, a persistent identifier that's collated by organizations such as Crossread. So we can go and search in their facilities for almost any scholarly publication that has ever seen the light of day and find a persistent identifier associated with that. Now, the, the purpose of having this view of the future is basically that we need to think about three things. The one is that I believe that the, the borders between what we say is a data center and where it exists and what it does and where the services are that, it's be, that is being used by that data center is going to become more and more fuzzy into the future. Alex mentioned the example of the distinction between the open repositories such as Mendeley and Dryad and so on, and your main specific repositories. It also speaks to this whole idea of putting stuff in the cloud. So if they're in the cloud, where is it actually? And what my thesis is, is that at least one of the things we have to make provision for in the future is that we need a way of persistently finding all the bits and pieces of what we're busy with without necessarily having it directly hosted by us. It can actually be anywhere in the web if we can find it reliably. The second thing that we need to consider is to navigate this knowledge network is increasingly going to become a non-human task. And I feel quite strongly about it that we are not getting ready for the inevitable automation in science as quickly as we should be doing so. It's impossible for us as humans to look at all the data we're gathering uh, personally. It's, it's been impossible for a while now. So we're going to have to start using machine learning and artificial intelligence mechanisms to generate new science. And to be able to do that, these persistent identifiers that we have that define things like samples and events or methodologies or concepts or licenses and all of those things in precise terms are going to be extremely useful and in some cases almost critical for us to automate the processes of science. So hopefully it would, won't put us out of a job. It will hopefully free our hands to think much more conceptually uh, and maybe defer some of the road tasks of science, uh, at least initially, um, to machine learning. And then the final aspect that I think is incredibly important and maybe overlooked is that for all of these things to work, especially in an automated environment, we must be able to trust these services. I'm at the moment in the process of helping ILTER, the International Long-Term Ecological Research Network, to start developing a model of how their federated data infrastructures are going to work. 
And if you just think about that use case, we have a situation where we have to find references, reliable references to something like taxonomy and life traits and physical chemical properties of the environment that we are investigating and so on. All of those things we are now spending money on building infrastructure, but we don't know whether the services that we are using to describe these things work will be there in a year or two from now. There are examples of how these things have gone south in the past, uh, things like the Life Sciences uh, ID that was established maybe 10 years ago, not with us any longer, and many people have invested in building systems on top of persistent identifier services that were not sustainable and are not existing any longer. So the third point then to make is that we need trust in this network of services if we are going to build sustainable infrastructure on top of it. And to our mind, this is one of the things that WDS sees as a challenge and an opportunity for the future to start looking at how to also extend the whole idea of trustworthy services beyond only data into all of these other aspects of our knowledge network. Okay, so I think I've more or less summarized what is on this slide. I am getting all kinds of hints from the, uh, from the organizers around the table here in front that we should wrap up. Um, so I think from, with that, uh, let's leave you then in the hands of uh, Alfredo. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, Alex and Vin. Uh, I would like to suggest, if you agree, maybe to have before all the presentations first, and then we will have a, a time for discussion and questions. So I would like to follow, uh, invite Mustafa Mukain. Mustafa is Executive Director of the International Program Office of XOWDS and also is coordinating coordinator of the data systems of the Belmont Forum uh, and one of the main responsible people for this uh, meeting here who he worked a lot in this to turn this workshop possible so please Mustafa. Thank you Alfredo. Uh, good morning everyone. I'm very very pleased to be here um, addressing um, this meeting, this workshop, um, I think um, as it was said before, um, we are very keen to engage data communities in the Latin American and Caribbean region from a WDS perspective, from the World Data System perspective, and um, I think this is a real good opportunity uh, to do that. First uh, comment on, um, I've received during the process of preparing this meeting a lot of requests from participants about the language used for the workshop. And I just wanted to say that English is not my mother tongue, and I recognize that it's a bit imperialistic in a way to impose English in this workshop, and I wanted to just express um, sincerely your appreciation for your understanding that many of us here do not speak Spanish or Portuguese, <laughs> and English is unfortunately the lingua franca today of science. So thanks for your understanding, and I hope that everything goes well in terms of, uh, in terms of communication. And obviously, we can have more in-depth discussions during coffee breaks and so on in, in case anything was unclear. I thought it was important to remind, remind us of, of this thing, that we are not all in native English speakers. Um, I, in my presentation, which, Alfredo, I was planning to speak for 20 minutes, now I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so I will try to, to be uh, as brief as, as possible. I wanted to address the question of international networks uh, and the coordination of international data networks. I think in many of the presentations, uh, welcoming remarks and in this, in this presentation just before, the idea of international networks came up and how they are important in the context of data management. So I wanted to just go briefly uh, through um, this concept of international data networks, where it comes from, how it is important, and WDS, the World Data System, being one of these international data networks, international coordination networks, I think it would explain uh, very much what we are, what we stand for. 
Ingrid, in her welcoming remarks, mentioned that um, we are all society is faced with global challenges. These global challenges, I've just uh, listed a number of them here, global warming, climate change, biodiversity loss, the water crisis, are all affecting us in all regions of the world. Now it's back. So these challenges are affecting us globally. All regions of the world, the world are affected by these global challenges. And the human um, 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 species is faced with a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of uh, challenges in terms of uh, providing energy, um, sustainable energy, provi uh, providing affordable health services, pov um, reducing poverty, re reducing hun hunger. So to address these challenges, um, now this is not working. We, yes, it is working. We need global research. And the idea of global research to address these um, societal challenges, which are global by nature and by definition, implies that this research is uh, both disciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary, because we need new answers to address these global challenges. It needs to bring together also all domains of science, from the natural to the social sciences. It needs also to involve all of us, all of the researchers across the globe, because the solutions are not coming only from developed countries or uh, everybody needs to be on board. And also this new research, this global research, what comes out of it is also used in mechanisms, very important mechanisms, global assessments like the IPCC or uh, in climate change or IPBES in, in, in biodiversity. And this global research has also requirements on the data side in terms of data management. So the data sets needed for this global research need to be global. They need to cover all of the globe, all, of, all parts of the globe, locally, uh, from the local to, to the global. We need also long time series. We need to invest into generating long time series to understand how the environment is changing, etc., over time. But we need also to invest in the preservation of those long time series, of all the, va the value added we, uh, we are generating by data. And by the, by the nature of those challenges, uh, by definition, because of the nature of those challenges, which are multidisciplinary, we need also to invest in data integration, to be able to bring data from different domains to understand uh, those very complex, very complex questions. And I think this is very well exemplified in the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure all of you are aware that they emerged here in Rio during Rio Plus 20, and they are now um, there is a consensus around the, uh, the fact that monitoring those, the implementation of those sustainable development goals will tell us how well we are doing uh, uh, in, in terms of taking care of, of, of our planet. But to monitor uh, those sustainable development goals, which are all interlinked, you can see in this diagram here um, the links between some of those sustainable development goals, everything is very much interlinked. So to understand and to be able to monitor the implementation of any one of these sustainable development goals, you have to have a global picture as well. Um, and, and you need also the data that's underlying. You need to be able to integrate the data across the different domains covered by the sustainable development goals. And while all of this is developing, we are faced also in the research, I think there is a very strong perception today that we are faced with a verifiability and reproducibility crisis. This is a problem that has been identified when research studies were not, we were not able to verify some published research studies because of the lack of the data that was underlying those research. This is something that we need to face and we need to address. And I think we learned from the previous presentation that open science is one of the answers to this crisis and also one answer to the global challenges as well. And one of the important pillars of open science is open data. If there is no transparency, if there is no availability of data, you cannot achieve open science. And data management is extremely important. Ingrid talked, talked about the FAIR principles. So data now, there is a generally agreed uh, um, principle that data must be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These are high-level principles, of course. They need to be implemented. They need to become a reality. But data need to be uh, FAIR. The concept of trustworthy and sustainable data repositories, um, Alex talked about it as well in his presentation. 
This is also a very important component to ensure that we have open data. And mechanisms like certification of data repositories, the certification of their trustworthiness, are, is also emerging as an important concept here uh, and an important mechanism. The core trust seal certification, for example, is one of the certification for trustworthiness of data repositories. And finally, the international data networks are also a very important piece of, of this jigsaw. And the coordination of these international data networks is critical because if we need data locally and we need to integrate it globally, we need to all collaborate in terms of data management internationally. And this is not as easy to do as it is to, to, to be said. World Data System is trying to, to do something in this area as a coordinating body of uh, data management in internationally. So very uh, briefly, what do we mean by an international data network? Just to make sure that we are all on the same page. These are research data repositories, networks of research data repositories and data services. I use data repositories as a shortcut for all organizations involved in data management. Working together in federate, oh, sorry. Working together in federated international networks to enable the sharing of data within a domain, within a scientific discipline, but also across scientific disciplines, and more, more importantly, across borders, so internationally, to enable countries to collaborate. And this really provides the basis for open science. Without this, we cannot have uh, open science as an international uh, endeavor. So I wanted to use the World Data System as an example to illustrate how it emerged as an international coordination data network and how it is evolving um, and then this will lead me to a, a more specific piece of work which has a number of recommendations for the future of, of these networks. So the World Data System emerged um, um, from predecessor bodies called the World Data Centers and the Federation of Astronomical and Geophysical Data Analysis Services. These bodies actually um, emerged a long time ago at the, the late 19th century during the international polar year, at least the concept of, uh, of these bodies emerged at that time. They were not created then. So they were cre uh, the, the concept emerged during the international polar year one, which involved 12 countries. This is a, an international collaboration um, um, sponsored by two international organizations, the World Meteorological Organization and the International Council for Science. And the aim of this is basically a research campaign, an international research campaign gathering data on the field um, to study the Earth system and focusing on the poles. The second edition happened in 1932-33 and it brought 44 countries together. So you can see that the international dimension, even at that time, was really uh, uh, coming up strong. And the data generated through this, this research, and you can see here example of that historical data, was preserved, but not very well. We have lost actually a lot of those data sets, very important historical data sets that were generated during International Polar Year. The third edition, again sponsored by WMO and the International Council for Science, took place in 1957-58, with even more countries, 67 countries participated in this, this two-year extensive research. A lot of data was generated, but this time the initiators had a visionary idea. They established the World Data Centers and the Federation of Data Analysis Services to preserve the data in the long term. Initially, they were based in a number of countries, in the US, in Russia, um, in, 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 in Europe, and the idea was that they would exchange the data across the different centers so that it is duplicated, safer, and also for the very first time in history, I think, the idea of providing that data in a machine-readable form came up. Uh, at that time, machine-readable was punch cards, paper cards, readable by, by, by uh, computers. Later, the last edition of the International Polar Year took place in 2007-2008. Again, massive investments in terms of research generated a lot of scientific data as well. But this time, the World Data Centers and the Federation of Data Analysis uh, Services did not fully respond to the needs for this uh, um, global research program. And at that time, International Council for Science decided to create the World Data System. And one of the main criticism they received at that time 
World Data Centers and the others, was the fact that they would, did not operate as a network. So World Data System was created to enable that coordination um, across uh, the various data centers which were serving very uh, specific disciplines. So today, the World Data System, here you can see a map, not sure you can see it in the back of the room, sorry, but you can find it on our website, um, has members all over the world. But you will notice very easily that we have two blatant gaps in Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we are working, as Ingrid said, by organizing a number of activities in these regions to try and improve um, penetration of the world data system in, in, these, in these regions. In terms of disciplinary coverage as well, we have evolved a lot. Originally here, it was mostly concerned with earth sciences, geosciences. Now we are expanding into social sciences, uh, medical sciences, health sciences, because we recognize that all of the challenges I mentioned earlier need multiple dis more disciplines than just the um, earth, earth sciences. The, the umbrella body sponsoring the, international, the World Data System is the International Council for Science. Very briefly, this is a non-governmental organization. It brings together national bodies like the Brazilian Academy of Sciences hosting us today. Uh, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences is a member of the, the International Council for Science, which represents 142 countries. They also include, as members, international scientific unions, which represent disciplines, so astronomy, geosciences, um, um, all kinds of, uh, of disciplines. And they sponsor also interdisciplinary bodies. And WDS is one of those interdisciplinary bodies. There are others de dealing with specific international collaborative research, like global sustainability for future Earth, or disaster reduction for IRDR, so a number of research programs addressing these global challenges I mentioned earlier. Very interestingly, um, in July this year, the International Council for Science is going to merge with another council called the International Social Science Council. And this will um, be the to form what will be known as the International Science Council. I think this is also reflecting this trend that we need to be more uh, uh, integrative of the different disciplines and that natural sciences and social sciences have to come together, including in terms of data management, to address the global challenges. The vision of the new council is still very aligned with what WDS is standing for. So scientific knowledge, data and expertise must be universally accessible and its benefits, benefits universally shared. So we're still aiming for that and this is still withheld by the, the, the new body. So the goals that were assi assigned to WDS as an international data network were to promote universal access to quality assured data. I think uh, Alex stressed very much that in his presentation. In domain repositories, we have this uh, focus on the quality assurance, the long-term preservation of data for the long term, and also compliance to data standards and conventions. This is also a very important topic for the long-term preservation, and the domain repositories make sure that those data standards and data conventions are applied uh, for data sets. And finally, WDS is also tasked with facilitating access to data. So again, um, that's part of, uh, of the mandate. We have three strategic targets, which I will very skip very quickly, otherwise we will have no time, but you can read them here. Improve trust and quality of scientific data services, scientific data um, um, nurture, and strengthen scientific data service communities because we believe these communities help the, the domains manage their data uh, in a good way and also make um, those data services linked to the, to the research. You can find this uh, on our website as well. But WDS in itself is a network of um, uh, data repositories, but this network contains other networks and we've heard uh, some of them named uh, already. So, for example, we have as our network members uh, organizations like GBIF, uh, dealing with biodiversity data, IUDE, oceanography data, IVOA, astronomical data, um, others like IRIS, seismology data, GNSS data, and so on. So, it's, WDS is really a network of networks, and these networks also do a very important um, work in terms of data management and making data in those domains uh, accessible. Around these networks, there are a myriad of other data-related organizations, and these data-related organizations support those data networks. Um, um, both Alex and Vim cited DataSite and, 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 and others, 
And, and these provide services that are really important, data services that are really important for the data net, the international data networks. But there are also other organizations which help, for example, improve interoperability, like Research Data Alliance, and we will have a presentation from Leslie right after mine, um, which help um, also support these international data networks. Funders, publishers, data po uh, policy makers also have a role to play in this. So because of this very complex landscape around international data uh, uh, networks, WDS um, worked with the OECD Global Science Forum and established an expert group to try and come up with some recommendations to support the establishment of these uh, networks. We published a report, you can find the link here, there's a digital object identifier for this report. With, which contains, um, uh, in, in, some, in, in some way, uh, an analysis of the landscape of international data networks and come up, comes up with some recommendations. In this diagram, which you can find in the report, we tried, uh, the expert group tried to um, characterize the different components, the different stakeholders. So the, net, the, the international networks are here in the middle of this diagram. Basically, on top, you have the user community, um, defining some of the interaction with these networks. You have international organizations I mentioned which support the networks. Funders which as uh, they do invest into the international networks and national authorities here at the bottom defining those uh, and planning those infrastructures and also defining the legal frameworks under which they, they work. So all of these stakeholders basically in the recommendations that were developed in this report um, have a role to play to sustain those international data networks. Now, I have no time to go through the recommendations, so I would, li I would like to invite you to read the report and you will find very, uh, uh, very useful information in terms of uh, developing um, 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 an ecosystem of uh, international data networks, how funders, um, uh, how policymakers, um, how the networks themselves can organize their activities to be sustainable in the long term and also to serve uh, to serve their communities. So, um, as I said, I will just skip these uh, recommendations and finally uh, invite you to also attend International Data Week, which will take place uh, in November in Botswana. This is the place where we have these discussions around international collaboration for data management. Um, all, all things data, basically. So if you're interested in, in this international dimension, uh, I, and also um, you will find um, sessions, um, because there is a call for papers at the moment for the, for the conference, which is part of International Data Week. There are uh, sessions where you can submit papers until the 31st of May. So please look at the program of International Data Week and, and get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, so, uh, I would like to call uh, Leslie McIntosh. Leslie was yesterday here at the Academy uh, talking with some people about Research Data Alliance. And uh, today she will uh, uh, talk about uh, the Research Data Alliance potential value for the Latin America and the Caribbean region, right? Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. So I am Leslie McIntosh Borelli, and my colleague, I put your name on there too, because Ingrid Dillo is also part of WDS and part of the Research Data Alliance. So the Research Data Alliance is an organization that runs off of two principles. One is that data drives innovation, and the second is that data sharing accelerates innovation. Um, we are a global organization that was originally founded about four and a half years ago, funded by three primary entities, the United States, the, the National Science Foundation in the United States, the European Commission, and Australia. So most of our members come from that area. But in a short time, we have almost 7,000 members and we actually do have quite a bit with the largest number of memberships from Brazil. And, um, and of course, I cut off my country in this, in this picture, but I would like to add that we have 13% of the United States is uh, Latino. 
So it is very important for us to recognize that population as well when we are aligning. The other important thing that I want to point out is that while I represent the United States, my mission and goal, it, my goal is to, excuse me, my mission is to build the region of North America. And as you know, Latin America starts somewhere in North America and continues to go. But given that I am only one person, it is very important to find alliances with South America so that we can, um, because, because sharing data, we all have very similar data problems across the globe, but it is also important to find the counterparts here to help the, this initiative grow. So the vision of RDA is that researchers and innovators openly share data. This is across technologies, disciplines, and countries trying to address, address our grand challenges. And those grand challenges are identified by members of the RDA. So it is not by a government, it is not by any, um, any other body except for the people that come to RDA to bring those challenges forward. We also build the social and technical bridges. Those are both very important that enable that open data sharing. And this is through the system which I'll describe. The problem, I think all of you know that if you can't find it, access it, understand it, all of that, you can't really use it. So this is our solution in one picture. What we do is we have plenaries. So we get together across the globe twice a year. And we have groups, either interest groups, working groups, birds of a feathers, or we have co-located meetings. And from that, we actually want to come out with recommendation, recommendations or outputs for people to use. So it's not just to get together, although it's a lot of fun um, and some good wine, but the, to, to actually come out with outputs. And then this is the crucial part. Not only do we have these outputs, but we want them adopted. And that's what, as a regional director, I feel like is the important part of RDA for regions is that those adoptions take place at local levels. And I'm going to talk about those very quickly. And I did set a timer. Okay. So, oh, so here's an example. Um, one group came and said, how do we cite evolving data repositories? What do we do when data change over time? And they got together with a group across the globe and across research disciplines in this case, and decided on 14 principles that would be used that are needed in order to cite data in an evolving data repository. So the data geeks in the room, for example, if I can dive in, things like adding a persistent identifier or a date timestamp. And as someone who used to oversee a lot of data in, in the electronic medical record, I can tell you we didn't have those in our system, so we added those. And then different people adopt them, and then that feeds back into the group to say, where does this work? Where does this, where doesn't this work? Um, another output that we have is called 23 Things uh, Libraries for Research Data. This has been translated into multiple languages. I'm proud to say it's the only one that has been translated into Portuguese so far, but uh, there will be a link for that as well so you, so you can look it up. I think one of the important parts of our outputs like these is that we start translating them into other things besides English so that they have a broader impact. So, and, and a couple of people we talked to yesterday have some great ideas about that. And to give you an example of a group of birds of a feather for the funders in here. Funders have come together. They may be parts of NGOs. They may be parts of government. But they have come together, and I guess they have two goals that are number one, um, to provide a forum for research funders to update one another on what are their practices, what are their policies, and then also to develop a resource that lists current and open research data management plans. So it's not only the researchers that are coming together, but it's an opportunity for funders to, to come together as well. So the talk of this, you know, the purpose of this is what are the opportunities for South America? And the first thing I would posit is, of course, participate in RDA. But I, I will say on the onset that that is actually challenging because when you have two plenaries across the globe, it is actually very difficult to get to both of those. Um, that being said, Europe does a fantastic job of doing co-located events within countries or within Europe. One of my goals is to do that within my region, and I would love to 
determine how we do that in South America. I will give you an example of this. We went, we were invited to go to the Jamaican Statistical Society to present some of our outputs with the Research Data Alliance, so we did that. Costa Rica is having um, an activity for Open Data Access Week. These were people who were driven to create an event and ask if RDA could participate. So that is a way that we can start bringing what we do to different regions. And then um, there, there was a great discussion yesterday about also just having webinars. And we have people um, within RDA who are um, who speak Portuguese, who speak Spanish, and we could have those webinars in that language, and I think that's going to be very key to, to have that. That being said, anyone can volunteer to do that, reach out, and we can talk about how to do that. Um, now, that's the opportunities for South America. I do want to pause and say, and not to reiterate too much of what Mustafa said, is we partner with other organizations. So within RDA, some of the working groups are, are co-driven by WDS, which is a fantastic way to partner and move our organizations forward. OK. And I have a ton more slides, <laughs> but it is time. And I am enough uh, German to stop at time. <laughs> so what I would say is, this is these are actually on Google Slides. I will make sure that we have the link. You can get to them. You can look more about the Research Data Alliance. And then if you have questions, please reach out to me while we have a nice cafe, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, especially your comprehension about our time. Oh, so, just, uh, yeah, yeah, I think we can have uh, two or three questions. Leslie, so, uh, let's have two or three questions and then uh, uh, I stop for the coffee. <laughs> So please, if someone wants to make a question or a comment, I would like to ask to come to here to speak at the microphone. This is this was a very interesting panel. Thank you very much. I'm Claudia Bausemedeus. I'm a professor at the University of Campinas. Uh, but you are kind of preaching to the converted, right? So. How can we go on? Because, like you said, uh, data experts should learn, or data managers should learn about AI and natural language processing and machine learning. And so, what about they having to learn a little bit more about data? So, uh, this is a general question on how to talk to the non-believers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I think it was very, I learned a lot about. But uh, I think I would like to put a question to the panel because I think you, the, in general, they were very optimistic né, about uh, the idea of open data and sharing data. Uh, in science, I'm a scientist, yeah, in science you have the, the hope, yeah, that science is a common good, yeah? But in fact, it's not true. No? You see, you publish papers since uh, several centuries, but so now, now, in current time, despite all the efforts, 55% of the research publication are uh, under closed door. Yeah, they are selling, yeah. Uh, another thing that the 90%, 80%, 90% of the research money are concentrated in a few countries. Né? Then, uh, then I would like to put to the panel né, how you believe, yeah, that is possible, yeah, that to transform this utopy, yeah, of uh, sharing data, yeah, in a really a common good, the, the, uh, given equal and international access, yeah, to these new databases, yeah, and new. Development. I think it's a utopy that we all share that. Yeah, but I think you need to be also thinking yeah, on the, the difficulties yeah, and the barriers yeah, to 
this should become real in a in a reasonable period of time. Then I'd like you to, to hear the comments. That's one other one. Um, actually, I want to make the same question in another way. So, how do you move old school researchers from their way of keeping data to move them to the open access system, mind system? So, what are your ideas on that? Okay, thank you. My question is uh, related to the similarities and uh, differences uh, with the other ICSU uh, uh, work done by Open Data. I mean the. That is uh, what is done by Bolton and uh, Simon, and uh, we have been working with that group. Now we are attending this meeting. We feel very comfortable with the way this meeting is organized, and we want to, I mean, to know about the interaction and how we could have benefit from both or what to do. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so I uh, will. I can take a couple of these questions if you may have identified who's working. Yeah, thanks very much for these questions. Um, I, I think they're all linked in a way. <clears throat> um, the question about talking to the converted, uh, I think you're, you're right that uh, we, our starting point is that everybody agrees that open data and open science is the way to go. Um, and the way we target our message is more in a positive way, encouraging that trend than questioning it. Um, I think it was quite interesting because the second question um, started with science is a public good and ended with, well, scientists don't really consider science as a public good, which is contradictory in itself. So um, I think education is really critical here and tra training and, ed and education. And I think a, a way of addressing this question of how do we talk to the non-converted, I think, sorry if it sounds a bit, bit harsh, but we need to convert them. And one way of converting them is through training and education, making sure that researchers very early on during their education are exposed to the importance of good data management practices, are exposed to the need to have their research um, completely open and transparent so that it becomes uh, basically um, in, in line with the, conce the concept of, of science itself. I, I think this is, this is not something that is new, um, making your data uh, accessible so that your research can be scrutinized is, is not something new. The change happened at some point where we started having publications um, being published, uh, peer-reviewed, but then the data which were not in the paper were somewhere and we could not uh, get hold of those data. Um, so we have to go back actually in, in terms of, <laughs> of how we're dealing with, with, with data. We need to be more consistent and I think this really goes through uh, training and education. So it's a difficult question how to convince old school researchers. I think that was the question. Well, I think one way of convincing old school researchers, and sorry if this sounds harsh a little bit as well, we should wait until they retire. <laughs> and, then, and then we can move on. <laughs> and finally, uh, just the last question, and then I'll give the microphone to, to the other panelists to address this. Similarities between different organizations and uh, the different mandates. Um, I, I think there is, and I've mentioned this in one of my slides, there's a lot of overlap sometimes, but there's also a lot of complementarities. Um, if we take some, some organizations uh, like Leslie just mentioned, like RDA, are addressing um, a, a very technical implementations in terms of interoperability. And we are able to collaborate with the World Data System, for example, by bringing the research data community um, 
for example, the domain repositories to interact into this forum provided by RDA to develop practical answers, pra practical solutions to very specific uh, problems we are we are faced in in data management. So. I think things are quite complementary. Other organizations like CoData, for example, deal more with data policy and how we make changes, for example, at the level of countries in terms of the data policies. So to create an environment for policies to be more progressive regarding data management. So yeah, again, these things are interrelated, but no doubt there is some overlap. Thank you, Mustafa. Yes. Thank you. So to the flip side of wait for people to retire is to actually train the newer researchers. And that has been quite successful in, in places. If you start training the newer researchers when they come in in best practices, then that builds up. Um, so, so it's a slightly different focus. The other thing that I would like to add is, you know, going beyond determining what those technical solutions are is to determine how do we embed those solutions into the scientific pipeline so that you don't have, you don't put the burden of, of better research on researchers, but you have it embedded within the pipeline in which they work. And that's going to take time, but I truly feel like we've got to work towards that so that we, we can get scientists back to doing the science that they do and not have to think about the technology that they work with in order to do good science. Uh, maybe just two quick perspectives. Um, most of the OECD countries, which I think I agree with you, is probably 90% of government-funded research and development in the world now have an open science and open data approach. So whether you know, there, there may be philosophical discussions about this that are interesting, but in practice I think the pressure from funders that demand that research outputs that they have funded become openly available is just so overwhelming that into the future it will become a commonplace situation. And then from a developing country perspective, I often and confronted with this idea that we should not be sharing data because um, there are all kinds of issues of indigenous knowledge and exploitation and neo-colonialism and so on. But uh, my answer is simply always that the arrow points overwhelmingly in the other direction. South Africa, for instance, spends maybe 600 million US dollars a year on government-funded research. It's tiny in world terms but it is 90% of the research spending in SADC, the whole of Southern Africa. So for us to point fingers to the rest of the world where we are receiving overwhelming benefits from open data is a little bit uh, rich, I think. And I'm making the same argument to our fellow colleagues in the rest of the Southern African region. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that um and I thought the points you made were really excellent in, in, in um, kind of pointing out some of the disparities in access to information. So uh, I know that there's a, a major move among uh, researchers in the U.S. and in Europe to, 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 to basically publish in open journals. It's still not uh, maybe enough, but I, I do believe there's that effort that's going on. I also think that um, some of the lessons that – that the U.S. has learned in terms of data policy and moving towards open data are applicable to the rest of the world and can, in fact, uh, engender change. So, yes, we've been preaching to the choir here. We've been, uh, you know, talking about things that everybody here agrees and nods their head about. But sometimes the barriers are real, and we understand that. Specific to training, this week we'll be having our World Data System Scientific Committee member uh, meeting. And we will be talking specifically about developing training curriculum around data policy and data management issues uh, with a group called INASP, which is focused primarily on curriculum and online learning for developing countries. So we will be developing that and hopefully rolling that out soon. So thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit sorry. We have no time. I suggest to go on our our talk during the coffee break. So I would like to thank the colleagues for the explanation and everybody here. So then, thank you very much. Let's go to the coffee break. <laughs> Sorry.
sorry, we went too long. Him and no, myself, no, no. but uh, hopefully we got everything out there that needed to be said. <laughs>
trago a última e o apresentador, o Alberto, aqui, que ele queria dar uma olhada.
Ai, como tem gente chata no mundo, né? Você tá trabalhando num negócio... Pode disponibilizar a apresentação? Oi, claro, não perguntar isso, cadê isso? Pô, eu tô trabalhando, caramba. A pessoa tá... Disponibilizando vai... agora. Você sabe onde é que tu vai transmitir? Você já entrou no site do evento? Já olhou? Já leu? Ô, <risos> desgrama, sabe? Simples, Opa, só. Caramba, as pessoas não têm... Data management projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the session moderator will be Professor Sarita Albagli from the Brazilian Institute of Information and Science and Technology. And the speakers on this session will be Marcos Regis da Silva. Walter Chalier. Annabella Plus and Alberto Cabezas um, to make sure that we keep up with time. Um, and this is good for uh, the speakers and Sarita. We now have a, time, a timer on the back so speakers can be uh, aware of the time. So you just follow the, 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 the timer back there. And when you get to the zero, just come to your conclusions. 
So, Sarita, please. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, first, I would like to announce, uh, the organizer asked me to announce that the presentations will be available on the uh, workshop website. Many people are asking about uh, this, so the, all the presentations will be available on the website. And also, the presentations are being recorded on video, I believe. So I think also the, the videos will be also available on the website or on the YouTube, but uh, uh, we will let you know, okay? So uh, we had a very interesting panel uh, giving a, a broad view, overview on the international uh, situation on open data and open science. And now we have the challenge to discuss uh, the state of the art and future perspectives for scientific uh, no, the challenges for data management projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, of course, we have different conditions, different infrastructures, uh, different issues for sure. And uh, so I believe it will be very interesting to bring for the debate uh, the, our, our own view on uh, this debate. Of course, Latin America don't want doesn't want to be only a data provider, so we also want we want that our science will be, will be visible, but we also want to have access to uh, 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 scientific data that are being produced uh, at our international level. So we have also technical issues, but also political or geopolitical issues under debate. So I first uh, invite the first presenter, Dr. Marcos Regis da Silva, uh, executive, executive director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research in Uruguay. He will talk about scientific data initiatives and the multilateral context. Please, each one have 15 minutes, and the timer is there, and we the debate will have the debate at the end of the presentations. Uh, can everybody hear me? Muito obrigado pela hospitalidade. Academia Brasileira de Ciências e também o Museu da Manhã. Eu sou carioca, mas infelizmente vou falar em inglês. A gente é o país do futuro, quem sabe daqui a 100 anos essa palestra vai ser em português. Para onde que eu... Ah. Ah, eu venho de uma organização intergovernamental. Eu trabalho para governos. E é muito diferente de um tipo de organização que é uma cooperação, uma federação, a gente, nós somos secretários para governos e governos que fazem a decisão. E nesse contexto, a nossa organização, the IEI pursues the principles of scientific excellence, international interdisciplinary cooperation, and full and open exchange of scientific information. So we have the legal, juridical mandate for open data. Article 2 full and open exchange of scientific information. This is a legal obligation of 19 countries in the Americas, the major biodiversity, mega biodiversity countries, only a few countries in Central America and the Caribbean are not members. Now, the last decision to define and establish an open data policy and principles, and I think Alex's comment that every organization should have a policy. Now, the IEI funds million dollar plus research projects among three countries in the Americas. And most of these projects are based on global change, be it climatic change, immigration, soil, agriculture, health, and so on. And the three projects have to be among three countries and minimum. However, each research grant requires that the establishment, maintenance, validation, description, accessibility, and distribution of high-quality data. Distribution of high-quality data. 
And for your question, how do we get researchers to uh, make their data available? Well, very easy. We don't fund them if their data is not available. It's the best, it's the best bait. The agreement also says it will, fast, it will facilitate exchange of data. So the researcher has to facilitate that exchange of data. And by accepting this grant from us to the II policy for the free and open dissemination of results. So to us, this is the best way to convince, we'll be, we'll be diplomatic, convince researchers to make their data available. No money if you keep your data. Fully documented. I'm not. Now, the international framework, and in these discussions that we have in these types of data meeting, to me, it's very important that we understand the international governance framework that is providing the legal basis to make this data available. And if you look at every single one of these treaties, each one has a proviso to make such data available. The UN Strategic Plan for Biodiversity and the IHE targets, paragraph six. Article 17 of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And the CBD is important because it's a framework convention. UN uh, ICLAC, I think we have a representative here, and there's discussions on a regional agreement on access to information. I can't, uh, I can't emphasize strongly enough how much a regional context, a legal regional context to making this data available makes it, facilitates the argument to make this data open and accessible to the public. Because we are speaking of an ideology. Right? And every technology has an ideology. It's not ideologically free. And at the last panel, they basically articulated an ideology. They basically said open data is good. And in the coffee discussion, I asked a very simple question. Well, listen, there are some countries that are investing billions and billions of dollars in science. And to be diplomatic, I will name who those countries are. And yet, they don't adhere to this ideology. They do not make their data available, and yet they are accessing our collections of open data. How do we deal with this? Because what's going to happen is that there's going to be a reaction from those countries, from the OECD countries, the rich club, the rich boys club, that makes that data available. Right? How do we deal with that context? Well, you deal saying principle 10 of the Rio Declaration on access to citizens' data. The North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation, it's the side agreement to the NAFTA, has an entire article on making data available. UNFCCC, right? everybody knows UNFCCC. The Climate Change Convention has tons of stuff on open data. And if you look at uh, Article 4, to cooperate in the full, open, and prompt exchange of relative, relevant scientific, technological, and so on data. So within the framework of the Climate Change Convention, there is an obligation of parties, governments, that respond to an electorate to make that data available. So you do have the legal basis to argue at a global and a regional level that governments have a legal obligation to make that data open and available. Sustainable development goals. Everybody speaks of sustainable development goals because that provides today's framework for just about any scientific endeavor that aims at a very specific objective. You can look at the role of information in the science policy interface, paragraph 83. And there's a very good uh, publication called Data for Development. It needs assessment for SDG monitoring. I think CSUN was involved. I'm not absolutely sure. But this legal context has problems of its own. The environment, and here we, we, talk, we can talk about health, agriculture, uh, biodiversity, uh, oceans, uh, and so on. It is the only domain that does not have its own organization. 
health has WHO, education has UNESCO, aviation has ICAO, uh, even tourism has the World Tourism Organization. The environment is completely fragmented. It's a mess, it's a salad. 500 internationally recognized agreements. And what happens? That means that a decision under one agreement is made by a different ministry, perhaps from another agreement that has its own agenda, that has another ministry from the next agreement, and so on. Environmental, international governments is fragmented. It's a mess. And within this fragmented environment, all agreements have articles or decisions. An article is the law. If it's in a treaty, it's an obligation that a country has. If it's a decision, it's more soft law. They should respect the decision. Now, open data, public, accessible, and so on. We all agree that open data is a good thing. Uh, the II, we contacted the government of Uruguay. They're EGASIC. And they offered us their platform to make an open data platform for all our researchers. Right? We said, listen, Uruguay has an obligation to do this. Uh, can you help us? And so on. And they did. And in fact, Montevideo and Uruguay have a long history in participation in open data. Uh, that's our open data platform. It's not really old. There's also things like the Latin American Open Data Initiative that is trying to convince governments to participate in this. But it's still a mess. We have two parallel issues that I think are important to this meeting. First of all, global governance that we just spoke before. Parties or governments that have adhered, ratified an agreement have an obligation. Now, what's the problem with that obligation? There's no enforcement mechanism. You can't force a country to do something, even if it signs up to an agreement. It's expected that they will do so. The electorate and public opinion forces them to do so. But it's very difficult to force a country to respect an international agreement if they don't want to do so. Just think of human rights. Right? Every country has signed up to human rights almost. Should we name a few countries that are not respected? Global open standards are voluntary. So think, um, I, I believe it was Leslie that I was discussing. We're making recommendations. We hope countries adhere. We hope organizations adhere. But think, we have a fragmented governance environment with over 500 treaties that can choose their own standards, and yet these standards are even voluntary. So there is no guarantee that there is going to be a coherent, harmonized approach to adoption of standards under the legal framework. You have organizations like GBIF that are governmental, that, but still, these are recommendations. It's not, it's not a legal obligation. So the conclusions, scientific data initiatives in a multilateral context have the governance. You can justify to a government your data has to be open, not must, has to be open according to these agreements that you have signed up to. But this whole framework is fragmented, may result in duplication, adoption of different standards, and competing priorities. International forums, such as the International Telecommunications uh, Union, they have the, the World Data Summit, do offer the space for governments to discuss and try to come to agreements in recommendations. Now, of all the areas that I've worked in, commerce has had the best success in this. And there's even legal frameworks for data in commerce to adhere to certain data standards. It's very interesting. Legal agreements on technical issues. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the single window for commerce, where they're trying to harmonize all import and export data, is a legal obligation to many countries, especially in Asia. They have a, a legal context, a framework, to be able to do that. 
It's very foreign. You think, uh, you know, commerce data is very simple. No, it's not very simple. You're exporting genetic resources. You're exporting live animals, wildlife, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, automobiles. Each one has a different data set that it must correspond to. So I think one of the recommendations arising from this meeting that I would hope you may consider could have special importance in the fra fragmented, voluntary, scientific, environmental data and information world. A mouthful. And I think this meeting can provide the articulation of a vision for Latin America. The articulation of a vision for Latin America because the expertise in this room is very good. Let's be, let's be immodest. You know, I know. <laughs> it's very good expertise that we have around the table. For the articulation of vision at a regional level, they may be presented at a global level because, again, we are articulating an ideology, and that ideology is under pressure right now. There's no guarantee that the whole idea of open data is going to continue because some countries that don't believe in open data are having quite a bit of success. And given our region's support for e-government, which is very strong, open access to scientific environmental data and information, this meeting and its conclusions can have a specific importance because the idea is to bring the conclusions to the government level, to your representatives that are able to bring it to cabinet at the presidential level. Under two minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So I invite Mr. Walter Scholle, Chief Librarian of the Hernan Santa Cruz Library of the Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean. He will speak about data, open data, and big data results of the LEARN project. Good morning. Just waiting. There it is. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the organizers. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, even very short. And um, there's a good reason why I'm just going to be here today. And, and uh, I'm flying back to Santiago tomorrow because on Thursday, um, again, we're having a big event. Actually, it's happening. It's starting today in Santiago, which is the regional uh, forum uh, on sustainable development. As you know, ECLAC is responsible for the monitoring of the implementation of the sustainable development goals of the UN um, for the region. <clears throat> and uh, the good news is that on Thursday, and, and this is the, the first time this, this happens, and I think this is uh, really, really important, um, is that we're going to have uh, a slot in, in this big event, a side event, on access to information uh, and the role of access to information in the sustainable development goals, and particularly of the library. So we're organizing this together with, with IFLA. So several people mentioned it today already, and so I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to kind of make the bridge between what we discussed today and, and uh, the event that we're going to organize on, on Thursday. So that, that's... Uh, um, now today I'm going to talk about the, the the Learn project. It's a project that started uh, more than two years ago and finished six months ago, but it's still alive and kicking. So it's uh, I hope to uh, to present some of the of the results of that project. Um, <clears throat> somebody mentioned in the very beginning one of the first sessions said uh, I mean of course this is this hype on big data. And big data are kind of intimidating for many, many people. I mean, kind of admiring what's happening there. I mean, everything that's happening on big data. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of difficult to, to kind of, how do you start with that? I mean, that's, uh, it's not easy. And so you read this kind of uh, articles, for example, this was in, in the Spanish uh, newspaper in El País, which was on uh, big data. And you see the image of the tsunami. This, that's not very promising when you see that. That's uh, wow, a huge amount of data that are coming. La avalancha de datos. 
uh, this, this tsunami of data. Um, and and I, I, it's a very interesting case because they present the case of uh, autonomous cars. And so they make a calculation in that article, and that's the following. Uh, one autonomous car produces one giga in data per second. And by 2035, we will have something like 2 billion cars in the world, which is a huge amount of cars. And they, each car drives between 300 and 500 hours per, per year. Now, assuming that only 1% of those 2 billion cars uh, are autonomous, then they're going to produce, and, and they drive just three, 300 hours, so kind of, let's, be, let's be modest. We're going to produce a huge amount of money, which you can see there, 21,600 yota byte. That's a huge uh, amount of, of data. And basically, the article says, I mean, we're not ready for that. Now, we still have time because it's not yet 2035. On the other hand, it's not that far. So our infrastructure, that's the conclusion of the, of the article. Our, our infrastructures are not ready for this. Now, we are using now 4G. And next year, we will have the, four, the first phones 5G. So we are making big steps forward because these 5G phones will, uh, I mean, between 10 and 100 times more data be able to process uh, 10 and, and 100 times more data. So basically, you will be able to download a high uh, an HD uh, movie in, in just a few seconds, which is not possible now on your phone. So a huge amount of, uh, of data. And so that's slightly intimidating. How are we going to manage this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to manage this, this tsunami? Now, um, what we basically wanted to do, and, and this was the philosophy of the, of the LEARN project, is that in, instead of uh, talking a lot about big data, which is, uh, which is a hype, let's just talk about data. And how do we work with data? How do we actually implement policies uh, for uh, research data? Because in this case, it's research data. And then there's kind of a lot of things that um, data and big data have in common. I mean, the questions we have are kind of similar, of course. I mean, big data is on a very different scale and a very different level. But let's just try to, to prepare ourselves for just data. And there's a lot of challenges there. And there you can see the, the, the challenges is that we, we produce already large amount of data, but not that many. So we can still keep all the data that we produce. Now, the question is whether that is still going to be possible in the future and whether it's still reasonable to do that. <clears throat> and also, I mean, very often people compare data with uh, 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 petroleum, because it's kind of the similar thing. I mean, if it's there, but if you don't extract it and you don't refine the data, then you basically can't do anything with them. It's kind of useless. So uh, it's kind of the same as oil. And it's also the same in, in, in that sense that if you extract it and you refine it, then it has huge value. I mean, it has... Uh, um, yeah, it's it, it just uh, it's very important. It has a high economic value. So I mean, we already talked about metadata and how to describe data. So how are we going to handle this? If we want to make data useful, we have to make them. Uh, we have to describe them. So we have to um, do that through metadata of data. Now. We, we kind of have now a model of centralization of, so we have big data centers here and there. And that's not going to be possible anymore in the future because we will have a lot of moving devices producing a lot of uh, data. So it's not going to be possible anymore to have everything in one data center. So we'll have to find a different solution there. And that's what uh, edge computing is trying to do. Um, then also when we talk about storage, we will have to take decisions on what kind of uh, carrier we're going to uh, be going to store that. Is it going to be on disk? Because then we have 
high level of avail availability or are we going to uh, store it on date on tape for example which is doesn't does not guarantee this uh, this immediate availability of our data so that kind of decisions we will all have to to make and this is just about data. And then some other uh, backup, long-term preservation, standardization of data publication is, is an area where there's still a lot of work to be done there. Then authenticity, integrity, uh, provenance, privacy, security, and ethics, and, and visualization. So there's a lot of challenges there. And <laughs> what we tried to do in the LEARN project was to kind of tackle these, uh, not all of them, but, but uh, many of those issues there and basically offer instruments to institutions who just want to work with data, which we are supposed all supposed to do, but we kind of lack the instruments. How do you do that? How do you basically how do you start doing this? And that's exactly what we wanted to do in this uh, in this learn project. Just to say, I mean, this is going to have a huge impact on us. I mean, as information professionals. As, and this is, I, I just adapted a few words in it, and this is a text from archival sciences. And basically for library sciences, it's kind of similar. So it's going to change the whole, I mean, everything that we are doing now, it's going to change it completely. And it should actually already be changing our, our jobs. Just to say that uh, ECLAC is, is working on, of course, on this transition from data to big data and, and is assisting institutions, statistical uh, institutions or institutions of statistics um, in, in the region to actually make this, this big uh, leap towards uh, from, from data to, towards big data. So this is the LEARN project. Uh, it's a project that started in 2015. 2015, 2016, a lot changed in 2016. When uh, we were analyzing in, in the beginning of the LEARN project, there were very few institutions who already had uh, a data policy or a policy for research data. And then in 2016, there was a lot of changes there. And there were more and more institutions who had actually started designing and implementing a, a, a research data policy. So these were the, the partners in this project. It was uh, UN ECLAC, it was University of Vienna, uh, University of Barcelona, and uh, LIBER, the Association of European Research Libraries, and the coordinator of the project was University College in London. So this is our definition that we used in the context of our project, which is a very pragmatic, very pragmatic uh, definition, which is basically all the data that researchers are using during their research and the data and the data that they are producing as a result of their uh, research. This is kind of the, the panorama of uh, of research. Well, I mean, research data is is, uh, is is all of this, but there's a huge diversity there and uh, in in research data. When we talk about open data, it's just a very small amount of data that are actually open. And there's a lot of data all over all around that are not being shared, that are not open, etc. And also forget that one of the big advantages of, of data, of, of keeping data sets, is that you can also actually do something with negative results in research, which is really, uh, really important. When we talk about open research data, this is uh, also, I would say, a very pragmatic uh, um, position that the European Commission uh, recommends, open whenever possible, uh, closed whenever necessary. And um, also in the UK, there is this vision of data as a trigger for, uh, for science. Research data is an enabler of high quality research, a facilitator of innovation, and safeguards uh, good research practice. Any restrictions to openness of research data must be justified and justifiable. It's a very strong position on why data should 
by default should be should be open. It's not only good for science, it's also good for society to share data. And these are some numbers that I also took from, uh, from the European Commission to actually calculate the uh, economic value of, of open data. So what, what did this, um, <clears throat> this learn project produce? Again, as I, as I said, the objective, the main objective of this learn project, and I have here uh, three, uh, which you can you can take. So the first one, <laughs> you can also download it from the website. But here is uh, a, a paper, three paper copies, if you want to take uh, one. So the objective of of the learn project was to develop instruments for institutions who wanted to implement uh, research data policy. How did we do that? We developed a toolkit with 25 case studies, and that's in this document. It's a heavy, a heavy document. It's a very nice paper because it's kind of a, kind of a, bi a Bible. I mean, you can, you can uh, take it everywhere. I can, there's a lot of information there. And 25 case studies um, from, uh, from several institutions in Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean who actually tell their story. They implemented a policy on research data and they explain what kind of problems they had, what kind of successes they had. So it's really a really interesting uh, collection of case studies of those institutions who actually tell their story. We also made an analysis of the policies, the different policies that institutions in Europe and Latin America have. Uh, we compare them against the grid and we identified the basic elements that all those policies have, and then some other elements that are optional and that, that can, can be customized uh, according to the needs of that particular institution. So that's a lot of material that if you are in an institution who wants to implement a research data management policy, you can just take and use whatever you want to use and whatever you don't want to use. So that's a lot of a lot of material. So you don't have to start from scratch. So uh, in UN ECLAC we were uh, covering the whole the whole region, and I think uh, kind of managed to uh, to establish this uh, community. So this is kind of the ideal scenario where you have. I mean, we start with good practices. You have an institutional research data management policy. You have a roadmap on how to implement this policy. And you have a research data management plan, which is actually going to assist the researchers in a very concrete way and answer their questions on how they have to store, what kind of data they have to keep, et cetera, et cetera. And then on top of that, all this is ideally supported by um, a plan on a national level, uh, which is usually done by the by the funding agency. So this is kind of the ideal scenario. This is an example of of University of Oxford. When we talk about research data management policy, we're not necessarily talking about a document of 50 pages. This is just two two pages, but it has the principles. It has all the basic elements uh, of research data management uh, policy. So you can see, for example, roles and responsibilities. You can see uh, um, the, the context of the, uh, uh, then the legal, the legal part, um, the definitions, very important definitions. So this is a picture of roles and responsibilities. Um, so the content supplier is the researcher. He or she is responsible for the quality of the data. That's a very important role. And then you have different roles like protection, legal security, and social responsibility. Usually funding agencies on the level of the social responsibility where we talk about transparency. It's one of the main arguments that we are using why we defend the openness of data is that uh, research is funded by uh, public funds. So we have to be transparent on that. We have to share the results of, of, that, uh, of that research. 
this is uh, another tool that we developed in, in, in our library, which is also uh, available. It's a research guide on uh, that kind of presents the same material, but in, in a more didactic way altogether. So you can, follow, you can find all this, and you can basically, uh, again, I mean, you can use it as, uh, if you think it's, uh, it's useful, but go in and have a look at it. <coughs> then there's also a survey that we developed. And we surveyed a lot of uh, institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean that allows an institution basically um, with traffic light system, very simple, to can you evaluate yourself, in, uh, to assess yourself, and where are we with our institutions? Are we kind of good? So are we green? Are we kind of moving forward, but there's still some work to be done there, then we are in orange? Or do we really have nothing and, and we're still... Uh, thinking of how to implement it then kind of red. But it's interesting because you can basically compare with some, some other institutions. And I mean, the situation in Latin America and the Caribbean and in Europe is not that different because what you have in Europe is that there are some institutions who, who are very advanced and have a research data management uh, policy on an institutional level. But there's a lot of institutions who, who don't have anything yet. And Latin America and the Caribbean is the same. It's just a bigger continent, so it, it takes a bit more time. But there are several institutions that are very advanced, including here in, in Brazil, for example. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. And I think this is the main question. Um, the, the main question... I mean, we have to just jump into the water, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether we're jumping like this or like that. It just requires some exercise, but the most important thing is to jump into the water and just uh, take the challenge of data and start in, uh, working with it in our institutions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, just an announcement. Uh, those who will present in the afternoon, please give your presentations to Annie Klinio. Annie? Here, aqueles que vão apresentar à tarde, que ainda não entregaram suas apresentações, por favor, entreguem para a Anne. Uh, please, I will invite Annabella Plos, from the Museu, Museu Argentino de Ciências Naturales, CONICET, Argentina, who will talk about global to regional, global biodiversity information facility and the Latin America and Caribbean region. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank this invitation. I am here to speak on the behalf of GBIF. I am the node manager for Argentina, and I am also the regional representative for the Latin America and now the Caribbean region. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I am really happy about the other talk that GBIF just pop up some, some several times. And, but everybody here know about GBIF or just hear it? It's an international network and is founded by the government. And we work with data of all type of life. Actually now our map looks something like that. We are near to the billion it's a milestone of data. And when I speak of data, we work with three different types. We have occurrence, that they are the uh, observation and the museum collections. We have checklists. We have sim simple data. That is our new type of data. And, okay, we have a lot of issues with that, but we are working on it. And, of course, we have metadata. And just for show, I, I am not sure if it's going to be with sound. I bring one a small video that we have. What what is GBIF? And the sound is not there. <laughs> I'm really sorry, uh, but we made this video because many people still now don't know what is GBIF and how we work. And well we try to engage almost all the country in the world. And this one is a video that was made last year by the node of 
Colombia, so Seed Colombia and GBF Spain, with funds that we have, that, well, later I'm going to speak just a bit of that. And we need it. We need a video just for show how we work in a simple way. Because we have license, we have portals, we have standards, of course. We have a lot of data, metadata. We need the standards. But something simple to show was essential for us. And even when look a little silly, maybe, because it's with just colors and all that, was really, really useful for engage new countries and for engage our bosses. Because that kind of person don't want to be reading um, really big document, like 50 pages. Of how is that? This one, this little video of it's three minutes, just help us a lot. And we're going to share all the presentation, and the video is going to be there. And it's already on YouTube and Vimeo, and it's open, and you can use it. Uh, for license, like somebody else say, we use Creative Commons license. We also use DOIs. Well, we try to be almost in all the issues. Of course, we have many. But we are trying to get the solution. And when I say we, it's all GBIF. It's not just the secretariat. It's not just the region. It's not just one country. It's everybody. We are working all together. And we have a lot of issues of language, of course. Just the region is a really big issue about the language. Because it's not just Spanish or English or Portuguese. We have many different languages at the Caribbean. Just think a moment. But we try. And we make translation of each of all our documents. You can search. And we are working all the time with that. This morning, I get uh, a request for a translation. And we work all together on that in different velocities. but. <laughs> yeah, because forget the translation to Spanish is easy, but what about Japanese, Russian, Portuguese? I don't know. Think about the world. There are many, many languages. Of course, we have it on English. Used to be on English first, but this video was like a, our small revenge that was in Spanish first. <laughs> A bit of history. How old is GBIF? Well, we are nearly now at 17 years. We start like an idea in 1999, like uh, recommended of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that we already talked about that. And in 2001, we start with GBIF. This is our map today. We have countries. We have different kind of organization that belong to GBIF. The different color is the green one, they are voting participant, and the blue one, they are associated participant. All the countries and all the associations that are there, they are uh, with a um, MOU signature. And we have big, big holes. We have a big hole in Russia, China, even on the Caribbean. If you check, the region is Latin America and the Caribbean, and we are working on that. Which kind of members we have on GBIF? We have both in participants. At last night that I checked, we have 48 countries with voting that we have our MOU, and we made a contribution, and we have a vote at the governing board that we make every year. We have 16 countries that they are associate, and we have organization that can be international, like I did bio, I don't know, catalog of life. I invite everybody, please, to check. You have the participant list there, just to check, like, curiosity, five minutes. And here you can see, I am not sure, I have a light. 
yeah, <laughs> I have a light. For example, Argentina, sorry, but it's my country. <laughs> we are a voting participant since 2002. We start just almost on the beginning. But our national node started in 2009. That is the national system of biological data. And we have one of the persons that work on the ministry here on the meeting is Silvia Nakano. It's in the front. If everybody, if somebody has some question, please. I am working with them because our node is the same from inside or for the outside. We are the same persons. You can see here, I put until the C to Canadiensis. But please, go and check it. What is a node for us? Well, a node is, is the central part of GB. Because without a node, you can work. A node has a head of delegation, a node manager, like me. You can have additional delegates. You can have node staff. But the most important part, they are the providers, the data providers. Can be official institution, natural history museum, labs, citizen science organizations, and the list go and go on. All this is one node. How many people you can have in a node? You can have one, two, 50, depend of the country. Some of the personnel of the node can be exclusive, like me. <laughs> or can be shared with another kind of functions, depending on the country. But you can do it. Some nodes, they are huge, like the one in Spain, that they have their own building. And there are another, like our node, that is really small. But we are working. And since, in our case, 2002. But let's talk a bit about regional collaboration on GBIF. In 2011, we create something that is called Know the Steering Group. Why? Because we want to focus on the necessity of the region, because we are different, even inside each region. And we have six different regions, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and since last year, the Caribbean, North America, and Oceania. And our region now looks like this. We are now 10 countries, an association, because we have AndinoNet from Venezuela, and, well, CITED, that is Ibero-American. We have six voting participants. That means of that 48 that can vote at the governing board, just six hands can rise for the region of the governing board. And we have another associate participant. But let's speak a bit what is going to happen next week. Next week, we're going to have our regional no meeting in Santiago de Chile. And all the representatives of these countries and nodes, I say countries because the one that they are not still part of GBIF, we can count as a node, is going to be there. And if you see all the lack of green that we have here on the Caribbean is here. We have observers from Barbados, Belize, Cuba, Guatemala, Jamaica, well, Panama, and Suriname. How we work with them? Well, since two years, we have a program that is called BID, that is a Biodiversity Information for Development. It's a multi-year program founded by the European Union for the um, increase the amount of biodiversity information of the ACP nation. That means Sub-Saharan Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific. We need to help them. It's not just I call and they're going to come. We need to show and we need to help. This program has three different phases. We are already almost on the third. On the first phase was for the sub-Saharan 
Africa, the second phase, Caribbean and Pacific, and the third and final phase is for the sub-Saharan countries. But in 2017, we have a meeting in June in Trinidad and Tobago. We have three days of training workshop. There are all the happy faces there, all the person that we was working, because we've sent some personal, and even I, as a regional representative, was there. We have a system of mentors to help. And we have a regional meeting. It's the most serious picture. <laughs> And all these countries was present in that moment. With the bid, we have three types of grant, regional, national, and small. And for the Caribbean, we have one grant of regional, three of national, and four of small grant. And I'm going to pass it a little bit quickly, but you, you're going to have the, the presentation, and please go and check. This is uh, the um, regional project between Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and Suriname. All these projects, they are going to end the 1st of December of this year. Then you can see all the data published on the GBIF portal, gbif.org. Jamaica, Guyana, Suriname, Jamaica, Haiti, Belize, and Barbados. And our problem with this is we have another system for support, but this program of support is just for participants. Then we can engage the countries that, the Caribbean countries that are going to sign the MOU to work with this kind of program. This program is annual. This year we have 80,000 euros to share, to work all the countries together. And for Latin America, we have three different projects for this year. One about portals, another about checklists, and another about citizen science. Please go and check. You have all the list of all the years. You can search by title, by grant type, when it start, when end, and all that. Wow. Any question? I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annabella. So I invite Dr. Alberto Cabezas de la Referencia, based in Chile, who will talk about uh, public goods for scientific data policies in Latin America. Okay. Hello. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity, as, as usual. Uh, I speak quite fast, not only in Spanish, so in English is uh, so. <laughs> Be a little bit patient <laughs> with that. So, ah, there is. Okay, I speak quite fast in Spanish, so in English, um, I will do my best. But this is in English, I guess. And feliz de estar en Brasil en Ibic. Está mi directora Bianca Maro, que es miembro del Consejo de la Referencia. Bonita. Así que es como estar en casa de nuevo. Happy to be almost home. Hmm? Um, I will talk about la referencia, and as usual, I will talk a little bit of what we are, and mainly, we will present, as a first time, kind of a concept paper we developed on what we should do pragmatically to advance uh, certain issues on data science and uh, data in general. Um, with me also is Silvia Nakano, is the director of Planificación from in situ, Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología, Andrea Mora, she traveled from Costa Rica, and also is member of the council, so we are well, with everybody. Hmm? I will talk about something beginning a little bit different. I will try to show why. Uh, I will talk about culture, also identity, and where you come from. Because if you know where you are coming, you will understand where maybe we are going. Or at least um, reality is a social construction. So 
uh, it will make sense the point of view that is complementary of some of the point of view. And I will jump certain issues because metadata repositories are well known explained in the morning, so that's great because I kind of get confused sometimes when I try to explain. So, uh, this is what we are going to talk. Um, I will put later on the link where is the, this paper, the presentation, but the presentation will be here, so it's not a problem. And uh, this started a certain time ago, and as you see, we, we started from, the, from a view of federated network of uh, nodes in each country, uh, from people and institutions working in national organisms of science and technology on science and technology information, let's put it like that, in a general way, uh, looking for general, regional agreements, uh, based on national open access strategy. Our story is that background, open access strategies in Latin America, and how we are right now where we are. These are our associates, many of the names you know, uh, CONACYT, CONICYT, CONCITEC, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, Ministry of Education, uh, IBIC from Brazil, uh, but as you see, what is called the OSITS in Latin America also, the National Organism of Science and Technology, plus Red Clara, that gives support, which is the advanced network in, in Latin America. Was, I'm very fast. This is the background. Was created, was funded by the Inter-American Inter Development Bank, um, IDB, helped with the project, with Clara and the participants. Uh, to build a strategy, a common strategy, and was an agreement of cooperation between the ministry of this, organi this organization, uh, 2012, and those were the points, the points, so to have free access to the full text in open access, and a national strategy of open access, uh, endorsement of the Berlin Open Declaration, etc. The important point was, of course, kind of a political will to advance this. So we do three things. Technology, we produce our harvester technology mainly. So our engineers are the ones who uh, develop the technology to harvest the hundreds of nodes uh, and repositories in each country. Sometimes 10 in one country, in another country that I will not mention, hundreds. And we develop guidelines. Metadata guidelines, very concretely. We don't develop, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. You will see that mainly we adopt or adapt guidelines. And the agreements that uh, getting agreements among nine or eight people from government is, uh, has been a long story, but uh, we trust we have advanced a lot, I believe, and now we go faster. A change was from 14 to 16 that was self-sustained, no more projects financed uh, membership by the countries. So that uh, means that the council started to decide very clear the direction of what we are going to do. Um, a series of point of harvesting and growing and making the service run. That was the main uh, point. Uh, and since, let's say, 92 years ago, we can say that we started to focus, as said, in technology. Now, the platforms of harvesting different kind of metadata are installed in this country and is in beta in El Salvador and uh, in Argentina. I hope to, we hope to launch very soon that. Um, I will not enter into the technology, but we plan to transfer the last version half of 19, half of this year, we finish. Uh, probably we'll start to develop new tools to harvest uh, data, metadata from data. Just we only concentrate on harvesting metadata. And with a number of reporting errors. But as you see, something that was not envisioned at the beginning, we never thought of developing that was a central node. We saw a real need from the countries to have transfer of technology and they can appropriate the tools. Their engineers uh, see the code. Uh, they have someone 
who can answer the question and slowly there's but we hope that we'll take uh, every day more speed is to uh, collaborate among uh, make the collaboration work more among the engineers to develop uh, code. It's not that we want to do the <laughs> harvester, the best harvester of the world. It's someday we'll come maybe a new one and we'll be better and we change it. We are very pragmatic, but we have enough engineers and very good engineers here to develop uh, solutions. It's not a sort of we will do it. No, it's now it's the best way to do it because uh, we can support each other and we can install in certain infrastructure that are available hmm, for small institutions also. One part that we do is project, usually project is 20% of our budget, it's not more, so 80% is basically, as I said, uh, is the decision and support from the governments in the project that we decide. And the one obviously is coming from the tradition of uh, open access literature. Now, today also, uh, OpenAIDE was mentioned also in the morning. It's a platform from Horizon 2020 at the beginning for literature, now for uh, open data, open science. And we work specifically those years in adapting the metadata guideline for publication result to Latin America, making the standard for the region. It was not easy, as you can imagine, to move a region to that kind of decision <laughs> and that the country doesn't say, no, my guidelines are bad. So that was, seems easy, it was not easy, but it was worth it. I think that was, we think that was a good decision. We want to, we need to work internationally. There's no way. And of course, we have a huge challenge about, because one thing is to have the metadata at the, at the national node that recollect. And our huge challenge is to arrive with those guidelines to the hundreds of individual repositories in every country. That is one of the things that we must continue to concentrate, to work with the libraries and institute of research that are doing repositories to work on those guidelines. And a number of pilots we developed. Um, with COAR, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. And now we will start a new collaboration on two challenge. Some seems a little bit old, but still is present even in this year. Uh, common statistic between the two regions and common statistic that are distributed and we can count the same thing <laughs> because uh, really uh, if we want to know what's going on and work with the journals, etc., we need to uh, have uh, reliability on those kind of statistics. That uh, seems easy, it's not easy at all. Moving to a new version that includes uh, guidelines for metadata for data and a broker system. This is, sounds exotic, but it's we try to avoid duplication of effort. If there is a paper and the metadata or the data or the metadata of the data of the paper in some country, I need to subscribe to certain systems that say, this is there, there's the data, and I just can push it, get it, and not start, and not make our librarians to start to enter once and over again and again, as well as the researcher doing again and again this. Okay. We leave it now five minutes, ten minutes is what is for this meeting especially we prepared that. In in September of nineteen sixteen, the council made the decision to enter and decide and make action regarding open science. Specifically data repositories. That was a political decision. October last year in Buenos Aires concept paper. It's not, I would call it a concept paper. It's not a journal paper. It's a vision. It's uh, putting in common the experience of these years uh, to see the common elements. And when there's common element, of course, making agreements also on what we should do. And we, that's the link we will publish, but we will publish also in English and Portuguese next week. It's already on the pipeline. And there's seven slides, and those are the points. First, uh, there's a 
transition, specifically with the vision of public goods. Uh, we believe, of course, uh, it's a mean, not an end. Always science should be open. Now we can do it because there's a political will, there's a technical possibilities, but it's not just an end. It's a way science should be, as the document of uh, OECD says. We need to move, make this transition, not transition, continue to continue to, to work on uh, open access in publication based on our tradition, embrace this new challenge. What kind of public goods? Because you, you can say, well, guidelines and standard is the usual definition of a public good that helps to economies of scale and scope, especially among many people. Model of governance, suggestions of uh, code, technology, some power infrastructure, and especially the focus is funding the result of R&D. That's what is our main DNA, if uh, we want to say. But, it's not but, it's <laughs> We have to keep in mind that this is the continent with the longest tradition in open access. So this is, since last, this is the last 20 years here, started in many cases what are, you know, the open journal like Cielo with no APC, uh, installation of uh, PKP tools for develop their own journals. Repositories were created a lot. If you look any statistic, we can discuss later on the quality or not, but what is the production of Latin America in the main index of, of journal, commercial index? Yes, we are four. If you took it another, it's two and a half, four and a half. If you took, at least in numbers, the numbers of open access journal, the number of repositories, we are 12%. So that's, the, that's our history. Uh, funds, yeah, of course, R&D funds in every part of the world come a lot from the state or the government, let's say. In, in Latin America, this is today almost a reality. We do not have more funds usually from European Union. Private companies do not invest as United States, as Europe in R&D, or with the military industry. That is another system. Part of the member, La Referencia, control all the value chain from repositories to negotiation with commercial editors. So it's quite special. And we talk about the symmetry. Well, here the symmetry is inside the country. So it's not even among <laughs> our countries we have from El Salvador to Brazil, but it's inside the countries also. So my vision, or our vision here is not to, it's just to complement uh, why uh, we are suggesting, because some things are mandatory, and other are just recommendation, eh? like guidelines, mandatory and just suggestion. Priority is that at least from this part, we, we should take in account important. Uh, if we support national and regional publication, of course data and scientific data, hopefully, focus should be on that data that links to that publication. Because there's a double finance there. Hmm? Second priority, the data collected or gener generated with public funds is a uh, clear why in this context. Third, it's beginning, it's very slow, but the data management plans uh, that are part of the research proposal. It's just starting, there's an example in Argentina, maybe will be in another country in two years, but we are thinking those are the, between this huge area, those are parts that are important to concentrate. Well, and the tools, if the, because maybe I have the tool, but there is a software or special software to interpret that is not a general software, so I need that tool to, to read the data, obviously. This, I repeat, second, guidelines and license. Okay, clearly, we study this issue two years for interdisciplinary repositories, not for disciplinary, yes. It's just when the librarian, the university arrives and says, you, La Referencias, you recommend guidelines. I need to start 
an interdisciplinary repository at my university for data, scientific data. Okay, data site version 4.1. We, and we will start to explain that the next, the second half, the next year uh, to again make this recommendation, let the universities know so there's no reinvention of the wheel. To work in aligning open air and data site. And Creative Commons, again, is, here is not a discussion. We will discuss, no, this is the facto standard in Latin America. It could be CC0. And, but we just make a recommendation that is, could be CC BY or CC0 BY or CC4 BY or non commercial, chair like. Uh, it's not, I will say something, maybe a little bit polemic. It's not the fear or somebody take the, the data. It's again a point of the culture that I mentioned that is a sort of non commercial in nature. We have different approaches in that. Hmm? But it's, uh, I, may, I want to make that a little issue. Technology is kind to hard. We hear about the cloud, etc. That depends so much in the, in the, in the, in the What's the kind of service? Uh, could be centralized, could be in the cloud, could be locally. Some prefer, as I say, software as service or not. We want, we are specific at what's important due to the fact that will be probably national nodes that want to collect the data produced in the country or about the country that there is a good level of interoperability at the level of metadata. That's is uh, kind of uh, the line. Huh? This, uh, so it could be, you know, cloud, could be locally based. We just want that there is interoperability. Second, at least, again, our experience shows that this issue of, for some institution of putting DSPACE, ePrint, technology that is kind of open source, transferable, so has been a good way to create publication repositories that are extremely valuable for us. Where depends of the country, depends of the legislation, there are difference. Affordable and with good protocols. So we are right to the key words, huh? fair. <laughs> that is kind of uh, the, uh, beyond the cultural change. Uh, we believe that, or I try to present that now we in this kind of asymmetry, we, we need to set certain priorities. We, we, as I said, open science, so many things, we decide to work in this area. And the first is that this proposal, this concept, this idea, I think that go very clear on defining, we are talking about this metadata guideline, right? we are talking about this kind of a standard, we have this model specifically, and we, this kind of, License recommendation. So what is missing or not missing is a huge point in the morning that was about PID, the persistent identifier. And we hope also that it would be a good advance with his colleagues and we can work the interlinking and that with someone's initiative. Finish? Conclusion? And I think that you almost can read it. Huh? The last one is the conclusion. Continue with the federation, international connection, continue to develop public goods, some recommendation oriented to fair principle, uh, because it has been a way to develop economy of a scope and a scale. Thanks a lot huh, for the patience. Thank you. Uh, so we have a very small time during lunch, so I invite the speakers, the lecturers, to have a seat and have a few minutes to have some questions, please. Marcos, Walter, uh, Annabella, and Alberto. Uh, questions, please, Alfredo. Can you 
Okay. Um, thank you very much for all the presentations. It was very, very interesting. Uh, inspired in uh, Marcus' talk, at the end of Marcus' talk, that we should think about uh, Latin American Caribbean agenda based on this meeting, I would like to ask the participants based in your experience in Latin in regional networks and regional uh, projects, uh, we, what should be the main uh, subjects of this kind of agenda? What we should think in a Latin American agenda for a scientific data management? Thank you. Manuel Limonta from Ixu. My question is for Voltrich. And uh, we we'll know that contribution, contribution to science is public in many places and in different parts of the world is also a private uh, contribution. I mean, companies, etc. They also contribute to the development of science. In the pipeline of uh, research in many uh, private companies, they have different stage where they don't publish the result because they are looking forward to obtain a uh, intellectual right position, I mean the patent. Therefore, this is not the policy of the open science and open data. This is a private science with uh, not open communication to others in order to uh, get uh, benefit and also uh, to obtain the, the money they spent uh, for the research. So I'd like your reflection about these issues and our police. I mean, how can we manage and how, how could we behave in good uh, relation with this type of activity? Uh, Mauricio Barreto from Fiocruz, Bahia. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, my feeling after see that this presentation of Latin America is very nice because you have a view of what's going on, but uh, I would like to challenge the, the group, yeah, that presenters, because it, at the same time, look for me, that is very shy yet, yeah, you're very, very in a, in a very initial thing, yeah. Because it, uh, I think all these questions of data, as was discussed in the first uh, uh, workshop, uh, put for us a lot of challenges and huge challenges. Because it, if you want to do science, yeah, using this amount of new shared data, then you need a lot of more actions. Yeah, that I, I put it at least in two or three levels. Yeah? One infrastructure. Yeah? You need to. To develop a huge infrastructure, yeah, to, to do, to do science, yeah, using and sharing, sharing and using the data. Because I think one point is to share data. Another thing is to use the data that has been shared. Nah? I think this is a, is the best part of the, of the history, yeah, to, to use the data to be shared. And this uh, uh, ask us for a huge infrastructure, yeah, that, that this need, I think, to be discussed. Another way is the way to do science, yeah, because it changes completely, yeah, because all the epistemology, methodology, yeah, and the other challenge, yeah, how to do science, yeah, because the big, because if not, if you don't think on that, yeah, in the, in the even of this new and huge amount of data, that you, you, Continue to do a very shy and a very timid and a very uh, inadequate science, yeah, for this new moment that you, you have a great amount of data and you need new methods, new way to approach this data. Okay? You have seen that in different areas. For example, I'm from the health area, 
and then with the genomic scheme, a lot of transformation in science, yeah? At the other time that there are these new waves of big science and big data, yeah? You need to do uh, complement our change in the way that you do science. Then I would like to ask the panel, yeah, how you see this challenge, yeah, and, and how Latin America is really prepared, yeah, to, to be in this new moment of the history uh, and the development of science in the world, yeah, on the basis in the data, in more data science than before. More questions from the back? No? Right. We need some new vo we need some new voices. <laughs> so I won't say anything. What about the cost of maintaining the data, which I've heard from lots of these uh, data curators? It's ninety nine zero percent of a project cost. Nobody has talked about it yet. You have to solve all the problems now. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes, please. <laughs> I guess we're going down the, the line. Oh, the first question, what's the, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. What's the framework? I, I have a bias towards a more legal approach to decision making. And I would argue that you should use the CEPALs, the OAS uh, frameworks that is provided in Latin America to make governments reach a certain decision regarding the sharing of data. Uh, legal obligations they would have to meet. Because I think then it would make your uh, point, the challenges on how to do that, much easier. Because then you'd have a legal framework to argue under. Uh, how do you change science? How do you meet these challenges? Or you do it by funding. And in Latin America, to me, it's much easier because most of science is government funding. So if the government could very well put a proviso on every single project is, your project doesn't get funded if the data is not open uh, in the long run. Um, with regard to the those uh, data that are in the private sector, that are very difficult to reach, the, uh, the challenges regarding that, um, I, I personally think we're in the honeymoon stage of open data right now. Uh, we seem to think that this, we, we've assumed that this is an absolutely good thing. Uh, an assumption I agree with, uh, by the way, but there's a lot of sectors that don't necessarily think in that manner. But I, I think it's like the crest. We we take a Bolshevik type of approach. We use the leaders, the revolutionary thinkers, we move ahead very quickly, and I think the rest uh, will follow. And lastly, the cost of maintaining the data, an extremely difficult uh, uh, question. I don't have an answer for that. Um, I think the best approach would be to make the, arg the, the economic argument that somebody, I, I, I think it was doing the CSIN presentation, that showed very well, explicit, clear economic benefits to open data. And if you can prove economically that the costs uh, assumed through the maintenance of the data are offset through more general economic benefits, maybe you'd be able to sell the project. Now, I don't, I don't know if economic costs of North America and Europe are translatable to our environment. I'm not an economist, and I can't answer that question for you. And I also think it's dangerous to think that the gifts, I think, from the developing world to us in terms of open data, foreign aid, and so on, are necessarily all that positive all that time. And I think that's why a vision, an ideology expressed for Latin American needs is an absolute need uh, from, from this uh, conference. Thank you. Me encantaría hablar en castellano para dar la respuesta. La sutileza del inglés. Lo, 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 lo esencial, no hay silver bullets, o sea, silver bullets. Aquí no hay un disparo, there's not a one shot that kills all the, the scenes. So I will start for your question as I seen the, that, that, that one or the other. So, uh, we, we are, we, we don't have a European Union. So when they ask how the regional coordinator, we still are based for good part for a long time on national states. Research is financed inside the containers, as Gideon said, of the national state, where still uh, were that. So, uh, in many parts, 
what we can do at regional level, and when we achieve many things at regional level, is when the coordination inside the country uh, between the different actors also is working well. It's kind of a, uh, it flows the, the process, and let's put it, let's put it like that. When it's a good coordination inside, it's easy to coordinate with the other country and, and goes like this, but uh, that's the reality. As, as you say, I agree, we will not receive enormous quantity of money from other countries, so we help to start to, to also to develop our own system infrastructure. Um, when we talk about cost, it depends. Uh, that is depends. What, what, what are the costs? Depends so much is, on what is the service. Uh, is a university that wants a data repository for a certain number? Is an international data network? Does a figures uh, move around technology, scope? Uh, so we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, draw a clear line on that. Uh, um so uh, that's our my my first issue on when people talk who pays uh, it depends because we came we come from many probably many sources some are the same research project that will be allow items to to that some will be certain governments that we finance depends on the country level some cooperation among universities there's not one uh, silver uh, bullet on that um, country level cost and what yes I have a, a small disagreement with, with, with you how we move is I believe because it's kind of a I believe in this what we're doing we are going a little bit we are doing more than the so-called perceived need because we are kind of uh, trying to say that's the the guidelines, the public goods, so if you want to start, yeah, okay, let's do it, and this decision. It's like, these are the stones, huh? And how you build your house, well, that's uh, it's up to you, but you will use this specification, at least. Um, so, this will take time, but I think that we are moving. Well, okay. Uh, I just can speak for biological data because it's the one that I work. And we have really, really different point of view because it's global. In, for the private data from, I remember one example in Australia and they share the data and it's, it's quite good, but in many countries don't. And for example, in Argentina and even inside the GBIF, we have a figure that is uh, sensitive data that can be uh, UECN species or even private data. And we just take that one with more care or maybe um, some paleontological data that we must to care about the exactly position that all for us is sensitive data. And with that things depend a lot of the country. In Argentina we have a law that we must to publish the data that came from public funds. We respect previous contracts and sensitive data, but we are forces to do it in a way. And that is not bad. I believe that for biological data was something natural <laughs> to share the data. In our country, that move of start to doing that for the care of the collection start a long time ago and was the director of the museum of, uh, the National Museum of Natural History of Buenos Aires. We start to put some researchers together and then GBIF came, and then when the time was good, the government came, and we have our system. But it's not easy, and it's not just one way to do it. No, not at all. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, the, uh, the first question about the agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, difficult question because there's a huge diversity and variety, of course, in, in the region. And as I said, um, that makes it quite similar to <laughs> Europe, for example, where there's a huge diversity also. I mean, there is uh, institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean 
that are very advanced, and yes, perhaps we are a bit too shy about this, and perhaps we should make more uh, publicity about those successes in the region that we have, and I think we should be probably more proud of those successes, and they should be, uh, people should know them. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, there are also institutions that are not that advanced, and I think, uh, if, if there is something that we can do in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, then I think it's to work on the institutional level. And this is exactly what the LEARN project tried to do, and this is exactly what we will keep, uh, keep doing. Because in many countries you have already, on, on the national level, you have a legal framework. So, that, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the context, that's the case in, in several countries, Brazil, Peru, um, Argentina. And uh, so you all have, uh, uh, well, what you need, I think, is really this assistance on an institutional level. I think this is something that we can do, and this is something that we would uh, love to uh, to con continue to do. Um, and, and if there is one difference, for example, with, with a region like Europe, the big difference, I think, is that on, in Latin America and the Caribbean, you don't have a big funding agency on a regional level, which you have in Europe. You have the European Commission, so the European Commission just gives a lot of money and says this is the these are the the rules of the game uh, this is uh, public money so you have to make them available the i mean the results of uh, of our project so i mean that's a big difference yes mm -hmm. but uh, on on the other hand i think uh, yeah um, then the second question about uh, i mean private i mean data from private companies and etc so when, when I was talking about research data, and perhaps I didn't make that clear enough, uh, I was talking about data uh, that um, are produced in the context of uh, publicly funded research. Private data or data in, managed by, by private companies, of course, it's a very different it's a very different story. Even with publicly funded money or data. Uh, produced by public uh, uh, funded money, even there you have the exception that, I mean, it can be a reason not to share data in case there might be a risk to losing competitiveness, for example. So then, then I think we are very close to, we're talking about patterns and this kind of um, issues. So, um, yes. I, I think also what, what we're seeing now and what's happening with Facebook is that, um, it's not because the private companies are managing all this data, or data, I mean, data that we produce every second walking around <coughs> on mobile. There should be also rules of how to use those data managed by pre private companies. And I think uh, this is a discussion that is going on and that absolutely is necessary. Um, <clears throat> third question. So, yes, are we too shy in Latin America and the Caribbean? Yes, I think so. I think there is a lot of successes. And I think we should be more uh, more proud of those. Uh, I think one of the big, I mean, one of the big reasons of the successes of of the Learn project, and this is not something that I just say, but this is something that has been uh, publicly recognized by the European Commission. The big success of the Learn project is that we uh, worked with European. And, and partners from Latin America and the Caribbean on an equal basis. So our assumption was not to say, Europe is now going to explain you what you have to do. You have to put those infrastructures, you have to do this kind of policies, you have to do this and this and this, because then you're going to have a successful research data management. That was not the philosophy of the LEARN project. The philosophy of the LEARN project was, we can learn from Europe, and, and, and Europe can learn from us. And I think that's a very important uh, starting point when you start those kind of questions or those projects, is that you start on an equal, uh, on an equal point and you just, um, I mean, you make clear that this is going both directions. And then the cost, uh, that's a difficult one. Uh, it's actually something that we mentioned in, in, in the toolkit uh, in the Learn Toolkit, there are still three uh, copies available. Um, I think perhaps we should ask the question, what's the cost of not having a data management policy? What I'm saying there is that what 
data are the assets of a research institution. And every time, more and more important assets, lo, lo, los activos, no? They own research institution. So, when there is an important loss of data, then all of a sudden, uh, we start asking questions of, uh, oh my god, we have to do something because we, we lost a lot of data there and we don't want this to happen again. And that happened already in, in many institutions, including in private companies, for example, that there was an important data loss, which means loss of money. And then we get an idea of what it means, the value, the economic value of those data, and of what it means that if we don't have, when we take this risk of not having a data management, uh, research data management policy plan, and policy, and then I think we start. So very often it's like that, and I think this is an important question to uh, also to justify because there's a lot of advocacy that we have to do. And when we talk to, I mean, university management, I think perhaps we can present it in that way. Often that is helpful. Is that all right? You're asking me. I mean, there is work done on that, uh, and every situation is a bit different. But it's kind of a, you can get kind of a general idea of what it costs to. Uh, to preserve data on, on the longer term. But I think an interesting way to present it to university management research data is to say, okay, if we're not going to have anything, we're not going to have a policy, what's going to cost? Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for one yeah so we're breaking for lunch and reconvening at uh, half past one and also a reminder for those speaking this afternoon uh, please for those who did not provide their presentations to give them to Anne who is right here we're missing a couple so please give give us your presentations so we'll reconvene at one thirty thank you very much for the panel.